Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to be interviewing 40,000 subscriber YouTube channel Raptor Chatter. So far, the largest channel I've interviewed in this podcast series. Would you like to introduce yourself? Am I at 40,000? <laughs> Last time I checked, I was at like 36, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for me it is. Um, regardless. Well, I'm uh, only at 2,600. Oh. <laughs> I'm only at uh, 2,600. <laughs> listen, it's what it is. Regardless, howdy, y'all. Uh, I'm Raptor Chatter. I do paleontology education and outreach on YouTube. Um, I am currently looking for master's programs. So, like, you know, I have some experience with general research methods. But I think more importantly with my YouTube channel... I actually do that kind of education on a wide variety of topics, be it things like brachiopods, which some of you may know, or larger things like Tyrannosaurus rex, which I assume all of you know. So we do a lot of different work on different paleontological research, and that's kind of why I'm here. <clears throat> okay, hopefully that's all working. Yep, I can hear you. Cool. I'm going to also start recording on my end, just in case you need the audio. Cool. So that's going on my end. <clears throat> yep. Howdy. Hello, indeed. How's it going over in America? I mean, right now, honestly, we, we got some snow over the past week, so just a matter of managing that. Mm. Uh, over here, it's getting pretty windy in Australia. I think I said to you, we're meant yeah. to be getting rain where I am, but uh, so far nothing. We got a light sprinkle the other day when uh, I was doing live stream, but- Well, uh, are you like, are you like monsoon uh, uh, in uh, ecosystem environment? N no, no, I live in a desert. Well, yeah, like monsoon where like you get just periods where it's very intense rain and then like almost nothing else the rest of the year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, that's like Southern Arizona. I mean, a little bit of northern Arizona too, but it's like similar similar area. Yeah, like where I grew up was was very much desert. Where it's like, all right, it's summer, it's time for our rain, and then nothing else the rest of the year. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right for where I am. Yeah, yeah. But, I I mean, like forty degree temperatures, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Celsius. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like one hundred and four Fahrenheit. I think where I live, my dad said to me that um, we once, before I was born, got something like 45 degree, uh, 45 days of over 45 Goodness. degrees Celsius. Goodness. But they'd tell the locals it was 50 days of over 50 degrees Celsius to scare the tourists. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> you know I, know, I know growing up in uh, Arizona, like, the desert can get so warm. Yeah. Fortunately, up here, we're, I'm in northern Arizona now, so we're at like 7,000 feet in elevation, like 2,000 and change meters. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a lot cooler up here. I uh, don't think where I am is really raised up all that off of all that yeah. up off the ground at all. Just wide yeah. open, flat, barren wasteland. Yeah, yeah, I know areas like that. Yeah, like I remember my dad told, well, my dad took me out to this one area that the aboriginals, the natives, have been trying to claim as some sacred site. And I remember he just went to me like, look at it, barren wasteland. Could you imagine a tribe walking out across this area? And I'm just sat back looking like, I don't think anyone would want to live out here. Mm. Just barren for miles. Not even the invasive species go there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Anyway. Don't they reckon that's what the uh, Triassic was like to a certain extent? I mean, at least the early part of it, yeah. Yeah, I remember... A big, empty plane. Yeah, I remember reading in... um few plants. One of my books, I think they reckon it was something like 30 degrees was that... 30 degrees Celsius was the average uh, temperature back then, versus like 17 now. <clears throat> Well, yeah, and, like, water temperatures, surface water temperatures yeah. would have been something around 40. 
at the equator. Yeah, I think they said which, like, like forty degrees you know, versus fifteen. Yeah, well, I mean, and like if you're thinking about like fish and clams and things all trying to live in that, it's like yeah, you can't just throw a clam into like a jacuzzi. Like uh, it's not gonna make it because that's essentially the temperature you're looking at. You're looking at about 104 Fahrenheit, 40 Celsius. It, it reminds at me the of, surface. At the surface, it reminds me of um the one YouTuber I watch, Wild World. He did this video recently because he covers a lot of cryptozoology type stuff. He did mm-hmm. a video titled "Are Mosasaurs Still Alive?" and that just got me thinking. No. Yeah, I agreed straight away. Um. But I was sat back thinking, like, um, just in the hypotheticals here, what if we were to take a Mosasaur, <coughs> like, Tylosaurus from the Western Interior Seaway, and then just drop it in the middle of the world's ocean today? And I think the temperature would have an effect. Mm-hmm. I mean... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, like, it would definitely be something that would be important for it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with, with shallow seas, like, they're able... The water is normally warmer... So, like, maybe you could get them in some of, like, the shallow bays or gulfs, like Gulf of California, Gulf of Mexico. But, like, unless you have something that's really shallow like that, there's not going to be enough heat, I don't think. Unless they did genuinely just become warm-blooded, which maybe. I'm not totally opposed to that idea, but... I think I read, I think it was in Darren Nash's latest book, or one of his newest books, Ancient Sea Reptiles. And then uh, 12 in 2017's Oceans of Kansas that, um... Perhaps mosasaurs were actually warm-blooded, so who knows, maybe. But at the same time, from what I've also heard, it's like the dinosaur debate of were they cold-blooded, were they not? Yeah. Um, real quick for recording, are you also recording my audio on your side? I believe I am, yeah. Is it is it all in one channel where it's recording both of us at once, or is it rec- recording each of us separately? Recording each of us separately. Oh, right, I'm just making sure that if I cough, I don't need to immediately mute myself on the Discord too. So, <laughs> sorry, because I know I know I did that earlier, and I'm like, oh, that might be a pain to cut out in post. So let me uh, ask about that real quick before we really get into it. <laughs> Yeah, just hear your voice cut off, and all of a sudden, like, hang on, wait, what? Sorry, just had to mute my mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that, like, again, if I if I'm coughing or whatever, you can you can edit that in post instead of just having to like cut out a section of whoever was talking there. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Good to know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um. Yeah, I reckon mosasaurs, if they were still alive today, they'd probably be more coastal animals. I mean, that's mostly what they were. There are a few that may have been venturing out into the water more, but Mm. a lot of those ones are very partial, so it's hard to know for sure. Yeah, I mean, well, could could a 60, well, 40 to 60 foot mosasaur really adapt for deep water life? I mean, probably not, because it would need to still oxygen, right? Yeah, like that's the biggest thing with all of these marine reptile ideas is it, uh, is it still alive? No, we'd have seen them. Yeah, like there's so much, there's so many shipping boats going across. There's so much life. Like all of the major cities are on the coast. Like mm. someone would have seen something and gone, "Oh hey, well hey, I remember." That's my take. I remember Wild World said in his video that at least with Megalodon and the idea it's still alive. You can at least go like, well, the ocean's pretty massive, and it doesn't really need to come up to the uh, surface to breathe, so it can just stay down in deeper parts. I mean, it, it could alive. hypothetically, yeah. Meanwhile, with mosasaurs, a bit harder <laughs> because, well, <laughs> they need to come up to breathe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, like mm. it's like asking, could a whale, could a large whale? stay hidden no you would see them because they have to come up to the surface right Mm. like that that's the same size of an organism you're thinking of Mm. yeah i mean wasn't mosasaurus comparable to um uh humpback whales in terms of length yeah maybe i mean a lot of that is still up for debate but that's a reasonable that's a reasonable estimate i think for the uh, most part I think I've seen estimates online saying Mosasaurus was around 12 to 13 meters, but larger estimates have gone up to about 18, although those are considered more dubious. 
Yeah, I mean, it all depends on how you're trying to judge it, right? Because there's nothing yeah. like them alive right now. Plus, so if you if you if you apply, oh well, its skull is this big, and based on veranda lizards, right, monitor lizards, mm. it should be this big based on its skull length. Okay, but they were also doing something entirely different from Varanids. So it's really hard to try and say that with any kind of confidence, I would say. Yeah, I remember reading something where it was about estimating the size of, I think it was Mosasaurus Hothmani in um, specific. And I mm -hmm. remember they said that generally most people tend to say as a rule of thumb, a Mosasaur's skull is about a tenth the length of its body. But yeah. I remember they pointed out that, well, mosasaurs are super diverse to the point that it's pretty hard to pin it down to just this one general characteristic. Well, I mean, and even a few years ago, there was um, Gaviolomimus. It was, it was a, a, a mosasaur which mimicked the skull morphology of the gharial, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, yeah, it has a very long, skinny skull. You can't just apply length as a flat metric across everything. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things that's it's difficult. Hopefully there will be some better work on that in the future so we can really try and narrow that down or maybe just a, more, a few more complete specimens to really show that. But there also may not be, and it doesn't really matter, in my opinion, exactly how long they were. Because like, we get it. They were the apex predators of the oceans from about 90 million years on to 66. Why for me, well... Well, for me as well, it's like a don't really bother getting too specific on uh, how big exactly these things were. Like, you don't need to go down to the very single, like, point kilogram of weight or, um, like, oh. every single little centimeter because, well, the estimates are always changing. Well, and there's so much variation within a single species, right? Yeah. Like, even just look at humans, right? Like, under normal conditions, we vary from, what, five foot one... It was like, you know, less than a meter and a half, up to two plus meters. So, yeah. you know, over six five, six six five is, for me at least, I have people in my family who are that tall. Mm. So it's just like, there's, there's a huge variation in the height of people. Yeah, I mean... Why shouldn't we assume that there's variation in the length of dinosaurs? There should be. Yeah, well then, uh, when it comes to people estimating weight, I even, um hear that about it well for me it's like well animals as well in the modern day vary a lot and my personal favorite example to use is one of my favorite animals the jaguar where from currently depending on where you look in its habitat um you can have jaguars ranging from as little as around 30 to 40 kilograms all the way up to some giants that are 160. exactly right and like jaguars are a great example because they Span such a wide breadth of ecosystems that they live in. Yeah. Because there's some in southern Arizona that are living in the desert, right? Like, mm. they need to figure out water. Meanwhile, there's others that are living in the Amazon basin. And, and I think mountain lions are even a more extreme version of that because they get down into the southern, around the southern tip of South America, but they also live all the way up to Alaska and North America. Like, you can't just ascribe that. This is the perfect example of a single species. There's variation there, and that's what's going to happen. Like, like trying to narrow down mm. a specific length or the biggest of the theropods, of the dinosaurs, of the whatever, yeah, is very difficult because there's so much variation. Mm. Yeah, I mean, well, like I was saying this the other day when it comes to uh, people arguing about um, the weight of Tyrannosaurus rex in particular, especially with a new specimen that everyone's uh, getting all hyped up about, the Copium Rex, as the internet's dubbed it, where, um, well, as I remember saying, people, well, with the Tyrannosaurus in particular, you'd probably find that even the very large specimens we have, like Sue, Scotty, and Cope, are nowhere near the maximum. So even though we might look at some of the higher-up estimates for uh, Cope at around, like, 12 and a half tons, you probably find there would have been ones that are way bigger. I mean, just look at alligators, if I remember correctly. Uh, I remember reading something in one of my books where you have these surveys done of sometimes up to over 20,000 alligators in Florida, and a very small amount of them will be over four meters, yet the record holder is four and a half. 
So, for all you know, there could be some Tyrannosauruses out there that did exist that were 13, 14, 15 plus metric tons, and we might not ever find them because they would have been a yeah. minority. Yeah, and like that that's totally that is a totally reasonable understanding to have for these organisms, right? Like mm. there's a chance there's one larger there there's always a chance, and it's probably a fairly likely chance. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. That there is one larger out there somewhere, right? Like it may not have been fossilized. Certainly, a Tyrannosaurus that was larger than all of the specimens we have lived eventually. They were around for at least two million years. This older Tyrannosaurus specimen, uh, Micraeansis, if it is its own species or if it's not, still that pushes back to Tyrannosaurus as a genus being around for maybe 10 ish million years, maybe a little bit less. But that's plenty of time for very large organisms to show up and not fossilize. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, like, like it, it's, it's what's the average? What's the average of the number of fossils we have? And just run with that. Say, yeah, it was probably around this large. And the thing is, we're getting to, I think we're also getting towards the functional maximum these organisms could have been. Because mm-hmm. if you compare something like Tyrannosaurus, sure, it's bulkier than Giganotosaurus. But they're still pushing similar sizes, right? There's there's only so large you can get with the theropod body plan in the Mesozoic with all of the variety of, of plant eaters around, right? All, all the herbivores, the Triceratopsians, the, mm. um, the, the Edmontosaurus type dinosaurs, even, and even things like Alamosaurus, right? Like big sauropods. Yeah. There's a limitation to how large they can get while still being efficient at using what they eat to continue to grow Mm. and i think i think the fact that we're finding so many that are kind of plateauing near that just to me says this is basically the plateau this is how large they could get more or less it reminds me of when i did um this a review of a couple of uh, dinosaurs in a arc survival evolved because as we all know that video game is highly accurate when it comes to its dinosaurs (laughs) And um, I remember just talking about the sheer size of some of the theropods in there, like Giga and Tyrannosaurus. And I remember just um, going like, well, when you look at the modern day, ver- well, the uh, modern day estimates we have of the extremely large theropods, the largest we know of, most seem to cap out around 40 to 33 feet long, with the only exception being Spinosaurus, as far as I know. So it's like, well... Perhaps they were just getting up around near the maximum you could expect for a body a body plan like that. Yeah, right. And like the same thing applies to sauropods, right? Like sauropods, the largest ones. Oh, is it Argentinosaurus? Oh, is it Puertosaurus? Oh, is it whatever? They're all approaching similar body sizes. Mm. There, there might be very slight adaptations that let them gain ten feet, three meters, or whatever. If if you're, you know. Something with a sauropod, that's a pretty significant difference, but those little gains aren't as significant when you're considering, like, yeah, it's the slight adaptation that lets it digest its food slightly better that lets it get bigger by a by just a fraction of it, the total size. It's it's mm-hmm. it is just one of those fundamental things with paleontology and biology where certain organisms can't reach a certain size. Yeah. And we can see that, like, with, with I think insects are a great example of this today, because like we can look at the fossil record of insects, and especially when you look back at like the Carboniferous, and not just insects, I guess in this case, but like you have Arthropleura, giant millipede. Why don't millipedes get that large anymore? There's not oxygen. The environment just isn't built for them to get that large. They have a functional size that they can get to, and a lot of them, the largest ones, are approaching that. But that's just where they're at. They, they can't physically get larger under current conditions. Yeah, that's... Well, it reminds me of some reports I hear of here and there of tigers and lions, which are pretty comparable in size. From what I know, you can expect them to be at their maximum, typically in the wild, around somewhere between 250 and 300 as normal. That seems to be the upper limit for these guys. But... You do hear some reports of Siberian tigers between 315 and 385 kilos, 
Um, for me, I sort of look at that and it's like, why would they need to be that big? I mean, from what I know, the current modern Siberian tigers are nowhere near that big. So well, it's I mean, like, part of that's going to be yeah. hunting too, because like hunting just has reduced the size of of organisms in the wild. But also, there's just this general trend for organisms further north or further south in their respective hemispheres to get larger, just because it's colder and being big means you can retain body heat better. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, you're summarizing tigers as a whole, and like the Bengal tiger is going to play its ecosystem far differently than a tiger that needs to keep warm in the winter because it's going to get to negative 15 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit or, you know, I like when you're starting to get into negatives, there's a lot of overlap. When you start getting really cold, there's a lot of overlap on temperatures. But again, same principles apply. Larger animals retain heat better. Hmm. So, I mean, like, like, it's one of those things where there's so much variation. It'd be really interesting to try and do that with some fossils. And, uh, you know, maybe see if Gorgosaurus from the far north were larger than Gorgosaurus from further south in their range. You would need to prove that those animals were fully grown at that time, which would be hard. But, hmm. like, there, there's interesting experiments you could do with that. It reminds me of one thing I remember someone said to me in a Discord server about there being a theory that with the whole feathered Tyrannosaurus debate, um, perhaps it was the case that the ones further up north had more feathering than the ones lower down maybe maybe not i'm not sure (laughs) i think it's actually really practical the one large tyrannosaur we have with feathers you tyrannus Mm -hmm. um comes from the j-hole biota and based on some of the most recent studies of isotopes in that formation not in the fossils it would have been at high elevation like even higher than i'm out i'm at it seven thousand feet um, it would have been closer to 9,000 feet, so like pushing 3,000, uh, 3, I'm doing math right, yeah, pushing 3,000 meters in elevation. It was high, it was probably mostly alpine lakes, it would have been cold, and in the winter, it probably snowed fairly regularly. And that's the one Tyrannosaur we know that is large-bodied, pushing 30 feet in length, so pushing 10 meters, that has feathers. I think it is a perfectly reasonable uh, uh, hypothesis that large tyrannosaurs in the colder parts of their environment would have had feathers and hypothetically young ones also would have yeah it was when it comes well i remember debating with someone about the feathered t-rex where um i remember they were saying of how oh feathered t-rex is quite possible when i was sat back like are you sure maybe because i will admit i am sort of skeptical because well uh, the feathers for retaining heat, and I recall reading something about a study that was done that found you lose any benefits of s- similar integument between, depending on environment, one and three tons, um, while well, T-Rex is getting up around nine, ten plus tons, so it's reached that limit of benefits, but for me it's like, well, maybe... Uh, depending on the area you're looking at, say the more southern areas, they would have not had feathers or not as many. But then when you get further up north, they would have had more developed feathers for the cold. But then, well, sort of like with lions with the mane, because the mane does actually vary a lot depending on where you look. And the climate does actually have an effect with the um, ones in warmer areas the main takes longer to develop and it's nowhere near as big, but then when you get up to more colder areas or places of higher elevation, you get these really massive mains. So perhaps that would have been the same case for T-Rex with feathers, and then on top of that, you probably would have found it would also be like lines with spots to a certain extent, where the real young ones have the spots, but then slowly over time they just grow out of them, they fade away, just being nothing more than a genetic leftover. Yeah. So, I feel like with feathers, T-Rex would have been similar to lions with the spots and the mane. That's my I mean, personal theory. No, no, no. I think, that, I think that's a good idea. It'd be really hard to test. I think the easiest way to test that would be to go to the J-Hole Biota, where there's a ton of different specimens, and test that throughout time. But you would need things that, again, preserve color, which is hard. Um, mm. And also somewhat inconsistent as far as the results you get. Um, just because you can't test the entire fossil for melanosomes at every single part of it unless you have a ton of money. 
because you use getting electron microscopes and all that, right? Um, <clears throat> then but what? I do think that is perfectly reasonable, right? Like, and it's not just lions. The example you gave of the young being spotted differently, right? Because yeah. even like cheetahs have different patterning than the adults. Um, and you can look at that in a ton of different animals, even just birds, right? Like closest relatives to, to dinosaurs, they are dinosaurs. Mm. So many of them, when they're young in their first fledgling year, have different patterning on their feathers. Um, mm. I took a wildlife management class, and even like you, you can tell the age of certain birds based on the, co- the color of their feathers, where it's like, okay, here's a wing of a quail. And you can see this little buff ring at the base of certain feathers. And it's like, that means it's in its first year because this just helps it stay more modeled. It helps it hide better. But then as it gets older, like it needs to start doing breeding plumage and all that kind of stuff. And it changes a little bit, not that significantly for quail. But again, you can see this kind of change from fledgling to adulthood, Mm -hmm. even very subtly in organisms that you may not think oh, these kind of random feathers on their wings aren't displayed, they don't need to change, you do still get some of that change. Yeah, it reminds me of um, when I read about some things, like with the... Well, I mainly use big cats, for examples, because that's the main thing I've been interested in when it comes to living animals, right? But, uh, well, you do notice a lot of difference between the uh, young and the old, such as the example with the mane, right? You see people asking, like, what's the mane for? And for me, it's like, well, it's a sexual display structure, not only because there was, if I'm a study in the early 2000s that pretty much confirmed that, but also for me, it's like, well, sexual display structures, they only come into being once the animal is at sexual maturity. It's capable of breeding. So, well, when do lines develop the mane? <laughs> They develop it later in life when they are sexually mature or getting there. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing, too. That's that's one of the issues that I think would be really interesting to do some of that with, like, some of the Allosaurus specimens we have is look kind of at their, their I think it's the lacrimal bone that has the little crest over the eye. <laughs> look at some of those at different sizes among different individuals because we have a decent sample for Allosaurus specifically. Yeah, there's um, tons of them. And, and and see if that's what's happening, right? If those if those crests get more prominent later on. Um, yeah. The Morris information is unfortunate in that it has a bias towards big things, not little things. So mm. understanding some of those, the, the youth of things like Allosaurus or even sauropods and, th- and whatnot can be very difficult to try and parse. But I think depending on what you were looking at, you could try and find a significant signal there. Yeah, I mean, well, I remember uh, I've been researching a uh, video on Brachiosaurus, and um, all I have to say is it's going as big as the dinosaur itself, and I haven't even read through every single thing I've gathered for that video. And uh, I remember one of the things I came across early on when researching was um, a uh, infant sauropod skeleton found in the Morrison, and if I remember correctly, they said they've assigned it to being some sort of brachiosaur, with it being believed that it's brachiosaurus because there's no other brachiosaurs known from the Morrison. Although, uh, I think I read something later saying that most of the features used to define it as being a brachiosaur um, are to um, spread out among the sauropod family tree, so it could be something else. But, uh... I found that interesting, so who knows, maybe we could compare that with the more adult specimens we have of Brachiosaurus. Yeah, I mean, one of the other issues you have, too, is these animals have to undergo just a ton of ontogenetic change, right? Yeah. They start out from an egg the size of a football, and then they become the largest organisms to ever walk on land. Like, you're going to get a lot of change throughout that organism's life, and they're Mm. not going to be doing the same thing their entire life. Yeah. So there's going to be enough change that it's going to be really hard to try to narrow down which organism is which, I think, especially with a lot of the young ones. Um, well, as I... for Brachiosaurus specifically, I think maybe Camarasaurus is not a Brachiosaur, but closely related from what I'm recalling. I'm not totally up to date on a sauropod taxonomy, but I feel like it may have been, that specimen may have been reassigned as Camarasaurus. 
Hmm. But I can't recall for sure. Uh, if you want to look it up or something, I think it was SMA0009, I believe that was the designation gave, uh, given. Uh, but yeah, I just, I just found that interesting, so... What sort of reminds me of the Nano Tyrannus debate. <laughs> yeah, there's a paper from 2007 saying that that is a juvenile diplodoc diplodocid. Oh, so yeah. vaguely a diplodocid. Like, yeah. yeah, then I think I read something saying it was a 2009 paper that said, no, it's a brachiosaurid. Okay. And then, well, that's more up to date than what I recall then, so... And then I think you're probably going to end up being more correct. And then I think there was a 2019 paper just analyzing the Morrison sauropods in general, which I believe concluded that uh, some of the traits used to define it as a brachiosaurid are just too widespread. So, uh, I guess we'll have, I guess we're going to need to go digging for more fossils to find out if it's a brachiosaurid or not. I mean, that's always what it is, though. In 2012, yeah. these co blah, 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 blah. Sorry. And so later, later reinterpreted as Brachiosaurid. Okay. Sure. Guess we'll go with that for now. Brachiosaurid. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah, sure. But better than being like I said, I'm not, like, I'm not, is it, is it not. I'm absolutely not as familiar as I could be with uh, sauropod taxonomy, so. Yeah, it's like that sometimes. I'm just set back like, what the hell is this? I mean, yeah. <clears throat> me, me and someone else, we've been slowly uh, working away on um, doing a, a live stream talking about different Morrison sauropods. I think he's doing Camarasaurus and uh, I think he said Diplodocus. Meanwhile, I got Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Marapunosaurus, and Brontosaurus. Well, and there's so many sauropods in that formation anyway, right? We, we like, actually you're already looking at so many. I actually pulled up the Wikipedia page for the Morrison formation when we were uh, checking it out and seeing like what to cover, right? Because I thought there was only like five or six or maybe seven different sauropod genera from the Morrison, uh, and then the list just kept going and going and going to the point that I was just set back going, oh, for the love of God, like this would be a multi-part documentary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and like that's just one of those things. It's really hard. Like, I know somebody else who, who is talking about tr trying to talk about the Morrison for one of their pieces of content, and they're like, I want to make sure I'm being very specific to the time and place of a specific organism they, they, they mentioned. Mm. Um, and they're like, I just... They asked me for help because they know I do paleo stuff, and they're like, okay, what should I look for? Do you have sources for what specifically was around at the same time as the organism they talked about? Because the Morrison is such a thick unit of rock mm -hmm. and it covers many millions of years and many different environments uh -huh. it is hard to just nail down and say this is uh, uh, th this is the Morrison fauna because it's so diverse and it didn't all live alongside one another yeah I so. remember I remember reading something about um, I think it was in Darren Nash's book Dinopedia where he talked about the Morrison in its own little chapter. And I remember one of the things he said was um, uh, that you got to take into account that a lot of these uh, genera, due to how long the Morrison lasted, didn't actually live with each other. I think he said, um, in specific, uh, for specificness, um, Torvosaurus, if I remember clearly, said came before Saurophaganax. So, uh... Don't expect those two to really coexist in the same layers. And then there's also just um, some research that has been published, but also some stuff that was just talked about at um, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting, where there is a distinct difference in the faunas you get between the southern Morris information, so Colorado, Utah, hypothetically Arizona, although people haven't looked at that a ton. Um, and like the northern Morris information, Wyoming, parts of Idaho, Montana, you get different groups of animals in the north versus the south. So it's really easy as geologists to go, this is the same rock unit. This is all the same, you know, big floodplain coming off the mountains down south where Arizona would have been, southern Arizona would have been. 
But mm. then you look at the fossils there and you go, but these are two entirely different ecosystems. Yeah. It, it reminds me of when I was, um, uh, as I said, I've been sort of interested in cryptozoology and stuff here and there relating to it. Mainly the big cat legends of Australia. That's the main one that's been interesting me. But uh, I also don't mind the uh, whole thing you see of prehistoric survivors. So I ended up getting the book Still in Search of Prehistoric Survivors by cryptozoologist Carl Schuker. And uh, it is a massive book. I think it's like 600 plus pages. So, absolute unit of a book. It weighs like a brick. Uh, not the biggest book in my collection, but still pretty massive. And I remember one of the things he said in there when talking about um, gaps in the fossil, rec uh, fossil record is that the Morrison Formation, it's hailed as being one of the most, if not the most, fertile formations in North America, but something like 75% of it is inaccessible. It's either covered up by other formations or uh, dirt and all that, or it's been eroded away. So it's like, so I remember being sat back when I was writing my Brachiosaurus video just thinking, I wonder what else lived in this formation? Well, and so much of it, too, is just the geology of where it where it crops out, right? Like, if you're thinking about, oh, Colorado and Utah and, you know, Montana, mm -hmm. there's a giant mountain range that goes through the middle of that. So much of that is going to alter the rocks, first of all, just because you, they're under pressure. They're going to get tilted and bent and folded, and that might ruin the fossil. Yeah, I remember him it saying... It also means a lot of it is still going to be underground, right? Like, like the, the Dinosaur National Monument in, in, Col in Utah, Utah-Colorado border. Um, I think it's technically in, U in Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> it, um, like, you look at it and it looks like a wall, but what you need to remember is originally that was a flat floodplain. All of those rocks are tilted. They're not laying down nicely the way, the way they would have been in life. And that's also one of those things you need to consider when the formation goes all the way out to Oklahoma. So that it, it covers such a massive area. And I think a lot of people don't understand just how far the Morrison formation reaches. Because it's mm -hmm. like, no, it would reach from like maybe the middle of Italy to like midway through Germany at least. Like it is a massive unit of rock. There's a ton of stuff missing from it, but mm. it's so plentiful, we can still find stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it It's just one of those things that just makes you wonder, like, well, as I said to you earlier, like, what else was in this formation? I mean, for me, the first thing that came to mind since I'm into theropod dinosaurs was how big was Sorophaganax at its maximum? <laughs> but at the same time, it's also like, um... Well, think about it, there's been how many different sauropod genera found in the Morrison, so who knows, maybe in some of those now eroded or covered up rock layers, there might have been even more. I mean, in my uh, in the script for my Brachiosaurus video I've been working on, if I remember correctly, I say in there that one of the reasons why Brachiosaurus might not be very common in the Morrison formation is that perhaps it lived in a different part of the Morrison that we either a haven't searched b it's been eroded or c it's inaccessible so for you I mean, know yeah yeah i think i think the accessibility thing is really important because a lot of people don't talk about that when it comes to fossils mm. it's hard to find fossils and they're in rock they weigh a ton if you find the most complete sauropod ever found it is a 100 foot long behemoth that is perfectly preserved with every bone. But you find it in the middle of flipping nowhere. <laughs> Nobody's going to be able to help you get it out of the ground. Mm. It's going to stay there. Because you physically cannot lift 300 tons plus of rock to get it into a museum. Me Most will... fossil discoveries happen close to roads. Because yeah. that's where people can look for things. Well, that was one of the things I recall reading about when it comes to... Uh biases and gaps in the fossil record and I remember one of the things they said is collection bias where it can easily just be the case of well um 
oh, we're only going to go to this one particular area because that's had the uh, best luck when it comes to producing fossils. We haven't gone to this area yet, so it'd be a safer investment to go to the already well, proven area. I mean, and that and there's a that can happen even on a very small scale. Yeah. Um, there's a site that the school I, I uh, went to for my undergrad, Northern Arizona, goes to. That's all like late carboniferous um, Pennsylvanian fossils. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you get your brachiopods, you get your crinoids, you get your, you know, that kind of fauna. And it's okay, well, this is like the hillside where people normally look. What if we just kind of like go around to the other side of the hill? And people were finding mm-hmm. tons of stuff. I mean, there was one of the best bryozoans I've ever seen that was found there by one of the students in, in the collections at NAU now. Um, and then, like, I, I, I found the only crinoid calyx in the NAU collections just because we essentially just walked around the side of a hill. <laughs> um, and so it, it's literally a, oh, well, this is where people find stuff, so we're going to stay here. You know, take mm-hmm. a 10-minute walk. Take a 15-minute walk. See what pops up. Yeah, I mean, I remember even reading about this when it comes to, well, they were talking about Megalodon still living and all that. Uh, Could it be? He admitted that it's probably one of the least likely cryptids he covered in the book to actually still be alive when it comes to the prehistoric survivor stuff. But one of the things I remember he pointed out when it comes to arguments in favor of Megalodon is that well, you hear people say, oh, Megalodon only lived around coastal areas and shallow waters. But, as I remember them pointing out, that's where most people find the fossils. For, you know, if you go out into the deeper water, you could find even more Megalodon teeth. Well, no, no, no. That was a, there was a paper... God, well, I want to say last month. I think last month, because it's supposed to be in my month review and I haven't talked about it yet. Um... Where there was like a deep sea, um, remotely operated vehicle, you know, doing submarine stuff research. And they went, okay, well, let's take this little sediment package, like, you know, scoop up some sediment or whatever. And there was a megalodon tooth in it. And they're <laughs> six, and they're five, six hundred miles away from Hawaii. So, like, even if they were closer to Hawaii, like, you know, they're still in the middle of the flipping Pacific. And they're just like, yeah, we just found this fossil. Like, we double-checked and, like, looked back at the film for when we took the, the sample. And you can barely see it there. We didn't notice it when we were collecting the sample, but it's there. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, no, like, you know, you need to think of Megalodon was absolutely traversing the ocean. The thing to really question, I think, is if it were still in the deep ocean, it would not be Megalodon. Yeah. Right. Like it would have had to have undergone so much hmm. change in order to survive in that environment. It would not functionally be the same as Otodus megalodon that we know in the fossil record. Well, you remember they point out when it comes to um, arguments over like uh, the anatomical traits of if some of these prehistoric survivors are in fact prehistoric survivors where you see people go like, oh, it can't possibly be insert extinct animal here, say, Bazillosaurine, uh, when talking about sea serpents, because Bazillosaurines had pretty stiff backs. Well, it could be the case that it slowly evolved over time more flexible back and became more like the traditional sea serpent most think of, but as I was reading that part, one of the things I was thinking of is, um, well, that's you've basically ship of Theseus a Bazillosaurine. <laughs> Can you really say it's the same animal? Yeah, right. And like, I think that's the really important thing to understand about paleontology and evolutionary biology as a whole is we have this these concepts of cladogenesis and anagenesis, right? Where it's like, oh, well, there's this clade of animals, and then there's just this offshoot of this group that became this other group, right? Mm-hmm. As opposed to anagenesis of one species evolving directly into the other, into another. Mm-hmm. In the fossil record, it is possible to show evidence of anagenesis, but largely with invertebrates. With the vertebrate fossil record, it is almost impossible to show anagenesis. And even today, modern evolutionary biologists often don't, it's an, I say don't believe in anagenesis. It's that it's hard to show the evidence for it in the modern day. Um. 
Mm. And so I think that's one of those really important things that we need to understand is just that there's these two different concepts of evolution, and they're both technically correct depending on the lens at which you're looking at it with. Because mm. because you can't just have, oh, this clade evolved into this clade. One species from that clade needed to evolve into another species, which became a new clay by evolving into further species yeah. and it just it's it's so hard to prove that mm. <clears throat> we don't have fossils of the first bird because the first bird lived somewhere random in the middle of nowhere probably where we don't have any fossils but by the time we get them in the fossil record they were doing fairly well it's it's that kind of concept where Sure, we don't have a first bird, but that led to the that, that anagenetically evolved into the diverse clades we have today. We just don't have that fossil, so it's hard to prove for sure that that's what happened. Well, we even... or, or that's the order in which it happened. Yeah, and well, hey, will we even ever find the first bird, or no, we have, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Right, like it is so hard to try and prove that you have the first of anything mm. you can say the earliest known but you can't say it's the first especially with like birds i think i feel like i feel like there's a growing body of evidence that the solarosaurs including birds got their start really in the middle jurassic and unfortunately the middle jurassic is terrible for land-based fossils we just we're just missing so much of the fossil record there oh yay it reminds me of one thing I was reading when it or watching when it comes to Australian megafauna from what is it the Pleistocene. Um, well, I remember they said of how Australia isn't the best when it comes to uh, fossilization of um, large animals or just animals in general because uh, well, it, it's it's not acidic. even that you guys. Yeah, you guys could have great and wonderful fossils. But no one is going to know because your tectonics aren't right. If that makes sense, right? Part of the reason the U.S. is great for this is because of the Rocky Mountains. We have this giant mountain range that just push rocks from deep in the earth up to the surface. Australia doesn't have that. They don't have a recent and potentially still building in some places mountain range that is lifting rocks to the surface where you can study them and find them. Hmm. Um. It, it's just one of those things. Since Pangea formed, everything after that for Australia has been separating boundaries as far as the tectonics are concerned. You guys in Australia, or sorry, you are Australia. You guys in Antarctica, rather, split off from all of the other count continents off of Africa and Asia and South America and all that. And then you guys in Antarctica hung out for a while, but still not really pushing against each other, not building mountains. And then we just and then you and then you guys split from Antarctica and just are alone sitting in the ocean without any mountain building events. Mm. Europe does well because of the Alps, the Jura Mountains, the Pyrenees Mountains, um, the the Tibetan the entire Tibetan plateau and that entire Himalayan complex in Asia. Mm. There's so much more tectonic activity basically everywhere else. <laughs> The Andes in South America, right? Like, same concept. All of these these big mountain belts are great for pushing fossils up to the to the surface. The top of Mount Everest is made up of limestone. You can find allegedly fossils near the top of Mount Everest Damn. because they were just pushed up because of the tectonic forces that existed. Australia doesn't have that. Hmm. Yeah. Well, another thing I was just sat back thinking when it comes to um stuff in Australian fossils is uh well not as many people as over in Europe and America nowhere near the population so not going to be as many people involved in paleontology so there's not going to be as many people out searching for the fossils well and again like I know I know with Australia especially like through the outback right like you have one road and there's no turns for 500 miles or whatever yeah <laughs> so like Unless the fossil is within 20 feet of that road and you know it's there or you have some reason to stop, you're never going to find it. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's one of those really important things is like finding fossils is hard work. A lot of the times when we find fossils, they are next to roads. 
because you can actually get to them. Yeah. Again, doesn't matter if you find the perfect sauropod in the middle of flipping nowhere. Because unless you have a ton of money to get multiple helicopter trips out there to carry pieces of it out, you're not getting it out. Yeah. I remember reading, uh, it was in Oceans of Kansas by Michael Everhart, uh, a book about the natural in, natural history of the Western Interior Seaway, and also about the history of fossil discoveries in Kansas. So it's basically a book for both the paleobiologist and the historian, I guess. And one of the things I remember he said was uh, on some journey way out west into North America, they ended up documenting some sort of large eel snake-like creature uh, that they found a giant skeleton of and um, they reckon it was a mosasaur uh, just based on the description uh, but as far as I know it was never retrieved because well this was back in the like 1800s this and was don't this was the year 1880 and it's like okay can we get an entire caravan of yeah stagecoaches out here to carry all of the bones of this out here and then try and reassemble it in the lab no no you can't and like the same thing needs to apply today right like Mm. there are fossils in collections that still need preparation that have been discovered 10 15 20 50 years ago right where it's like Mm. yeah we know this exists and no one's really looked at it more but we also need someone to just take the dirt off of it so that we can see what the heck it is and that's just the reality of paleontology. Paleontology mm. can always find stuff faster than we can study it. Yeah, it reminds me of one thing I was reading the other day. I can't remember where I read it. I think it might have been the book How Fast Did T-Rex Run by David Hone. I've been building up a massive library of books. I really like having reference works on animals. I find them to be a lot more pleasant to use than whatever I might find online, whether it be scientific papers or random oh. blog posts. To be fair, David Hone was is one of my favorite authors. I love <laughs> David Hone. If he could accept grad students, I'd be applying to him right now. <laughs> but yeah, um, I remember he said in there that um, you get quite a few fossils that just end up being lost to time because they end up being stored away in museums and no one ever bothers cataloging them or putting them in a digital database now. Um, so they end up being discovered like X amount of years later. I mean, with that latest T-Rex specimen that everyone's hyping up, the Copium Rex, as it's been dubbed by the internet, um, if I remember correctly, it was first partially described in 2002, and if I remember correctly, it also got, it got a brief mention in the book Tyrannosaurus Rex, the Tyrant King, from 2008, but then beyond that, we never got any proper measurements for estimating the size of it until 2022 with that, uh, Paul, with that paper by Gregory Paul with the splitting T-Rex into three different species. Yeah. I actually, I know the person who found that fossil. And he just said it was some sort of Tyrannosaurus. He didn't really get that deeply into the taxonomy. Um, Hmm. David Gillette. But, um, yeah, I'm like, that's a great example where it's like, we have this specimen, sure, it's somewhat partial, and like, there's plenty of critiques to make about that. There are fossils that are better preserved that are in museum collections somewhere that could be described, that could be something new. Or in private collections, right? Like, I mean, I think if you're looking at, like, the the stories around the the Myanmar, the Burmese Amber, tons of human rights violations and all this stuff, so some people don't study it, but it's being sold for profit. Like, it's being sold for jewelry, and we found pieces of, like, baby birds in there. So yeah. hypothetically, there is stuff that's even nicer that's being sold off to people for jewelry or as an art piece, and it's just sitting there. It reminds and that me is of, incredibly frustrating to me. It reminds me of Gigantopithecus, where um, like the, the, the dude found it by checking out some random Chinese shop where they were grinding him up as powder, grinding up the teeth, right, calling him stuff like dragon teeth, dragon bones... Oh, here, I don't know, it'll cure erectile dysfunction, so that way you don't need to eat tiger penis. Yeah, I mean, and that's one of those things, though, where when you look at the history of paleontology in Western world, too, it's not necessarily all, you know, wonderful and peachy. Like, 
There were a ton of fossils destroyed or damaged or mishandled or otherwise. And so it's hard to just pick out like one specific example and go, oh, well, China did this or tons of people have mishandled fossils. Right. Yeah. Um, I just I, I think that's a really important emphasis because I feel like I see a lot of people go, oh, well, China's clearly terrible at paleontology. And it's like, no, they have a lot of great paleontologists. You can critique rural agrarian societies transitioning into industrial societies plenty. But like that's not my place for that because I'm here to look at fossils and I can go, that's a yeah. tragic mistake that they grind were grinding up those fossils. But that doesn't say anything about their society versus ours as a whole. That's well, just hey, one thing I want to emphasize. That's all. Well, hey, during World War Two, Britain bombed the Munich Museum and we ended up losing the Spinosaurus holotype, the Carcodontosaurus holotype, and um, the Bahariasaurus holotype, I believe it was. And then from See, and, that, and that's why Tyrannosaurus would beat Spinosaurus in a fight. You don't <laughs> see Tyrannosaurus getting blown up in a war. Well, hey, I think um, I think the holotype for T-Rex was originally held at the <laughs> Natural History Museum in New York, I think it was. But they later moved AMH, it yeah. to the Carnegie Museum, I think it was. So that way you would avoid being bombed. Yeah, I mean, just out of risk, yeah. yeah. Um, Carnegie. Is the, is the pronunciation of the guy's name, yeah. Carnegie. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, then I, I mean, think... Like, um, that's a very minor mispronunciation. Nobody was confused at what you would have said, you were saying, yeah. so. But yeah, then I think um, over in Britain, Germany ended up bombing London, and that destroyed the holotype of... Um, I can't remember the thing's name. I think it was called something like Ph Philososaurus or something. I can't remember. H hang on, I'll grab the book. Yeah, I mean, like, that's one of those things where they're, they're... And, like, even, um... You were talking about doing Maripunosaurus? Yeah. That thing's destroyed. <laughs> yeah, where it's, like, we have the drawings of the fossil, and then it just turned to dust. So, like, we don't have it. It hypothetically exists somewhere out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the deserts of Utah or Colorado. But that's still not helpful. <laughs> for understanding their broader biology, that kind of thing, right? And, like, it's good to document that, hey, it is probably its own thing, but you're not getting value from it, if that makes sense, right? Like, you can't do scientifically important studies on how pneumatic it could have been, how, what kind of weight that that vertebra could have held. You yeah. can't get that broader understanding. You can kind of go, it looks unique. Alrighty, uh... According to the book, it was a uh, Fecodontosaurus. Fecodontosaurus. Uh, Fecodontosaurus. Yeah. Yeah. So some of those are. There's there's so many of those old things aimed, named by uh Cope and Marsh that are. Just. It's like oh yeah, this old specimen that's at Yale Peabody, Yale Peabody Museum, or at Carnegie, or at AMNH, or at wherever out on the east. I love one thing I remember reading, where if I remember correctly, um, I think it was Marsh, he ended up naming the Mosasaur Tylosaurus first, but Cope refused to use the word, use the genus, so he ended up making up his own genus for Tylosaurus, and then if I remember correctly as well, Marsh returned the favour by refusing to use uh, Camarasaurus from Cope, and instead called it something that translated to something like, um, stupid moron. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome. Yeah, no, I like, I mean, I think that's a really important thing. If you are into paleontology and also into history, and you're looking for something to do when you get to college and after college, as a grad student, just go, hey, I want to fix Martian Cope's taxonomy. And people will just be like, yeah, here, here's the specimens. Figure this out for us, because we don't want to look at it, because that's a ton of papers to go through. As a grad student, you're paid to go through it, at least a little bit, not a lot. But, um. <laughs> Imagine that, just bloody. Oh, you know what? Oh, this will be easy. I'll figure out the taxonomy. Okay, never mind. <laughs> No, no, like, literally, though, like, if you're a master's student and you're like, I just need a simple project that I can get done in two years, just go, hey, I want to figure out the taxonomy of Martian Cope's uh, Morrison finds at this location and this location. And people will go, yeah, that's fine. Just make sure they're all what they are. Sounds great. 
you know, some rediagnoses or uh, diagnoses of oh, this fossil is this because it has a slightly more depressed temporal fossa or something, right? Like, sure, great work, thanks, done, yeah. easy, easy funding, easy masters. You can get that done in two years because you just need to go look at specimens on your summer and then write it all up the the final year of your masters. Done, easy. Yeah, I think I've read something. Uh, one book I have. Pardon, if I'm correct, if you said um, when it comes to theropod dinosaurs, Cope actually holds the record for the most number of invalid theropod dinosaurs named. Where, if I'm correct, something only like nine percent of the theropods he named are actually valid. Versus... Not if Gregory Paul has anything to say about it. <laughs> Meanwhile, if I'm correct, I think Marsh holds the record. Uh, by comparison, of something like 28%. So, uh, I found that funny, just... <laughs> no, it is one of those things where it's like, man, these guys hated each other so much, and now we can tell that one of them was distinctly better <laughs> at naming things and the geology of it all. I mean, they're both terrible human beings, so, like, you know, they're, they're, they're both eugenicists, you know, kind of screw on that kind of thing. But I think I think paleontology needs to address the fact that, like, yeah, these guys were kind of angry. just fought with each other the whole time. Yeah, maybe maybe we should try and learn from that example and not fight as much and try and be more understanding towards other people. Well, I read something saying that apparently Cope throughout his entire life published something like 1400 scientific papers and all I'm just sat back thinking is like did this dude ever sleep? <laughs> well and like what you need to understand about scientific papers back then too is it could be as short as yeah. a page and a half of I found this fossil it was at this locality Dumb. uh <laughs> it's distinct from x y and z because yes three stupid reasons I name it this taxa. Thanks. Done. Easy. Uh, this dude's uh, new animal is invalid, and I name it this because uh, my source is kill your si <laughs> My source is I made it the f flip up. <laughs> yeah, basically the bone wall summarized. I mean, yeah, right? Like, it's just too... It is two men who are in their 40s to 50s, midlife crisis, being <laughs> petty as hell with one another. Right? Like, they're just petty. Like, you need to, when you sit there and imagine Martian Cope, you need to think back to, like, watching the, the uh, Mean Girls with Lindsay Lohan and all that. It's like, no, they're all this, it's just two dudes being this petty. That's it all it is. If they just sat down and talked with one and talked with one another like they were adults, no problem. It reminds me. But of they a decided meme. to be petty instead. It reminds me of a meme I made that I'll see if I can find it later so that I'll send it to you. But it was um, uh, American paleontology versus British paleontology, and with the British paleontology, it just had a picture of um, Sir Richard Owen, right, just sitting in a chair, looking oh so noble. Right, a fine gentleman. And then we have American paleontology, and it has a picture of Marsh, and then there's like seven or eight guys around him armed with firearms. <laughs> I mean, yes. That I mean, is basically... Like, I, I think that is one of the important things to keep in mind with um, paleontology in North America in the 1800s, right? Like, they were going into what was effectively the Wild West, right? Late 1800s. There were still the... Um, I'm sorry, cat. I know you're miserable. Um, <laughs> stop. Um. Anyway, <laughs> there's um. <laughs> sorry, I lost my train of thought because my cat. Um. No, like they're going to the wild west. They're needing to deal with the indigenous peoples who are otherwise being actively exterminated by the U.S. military, right? Like. Yeah. This is the same time period that the battle at Little Bighorn happens, which American viewers will know what that is for people who aren't. 
uh, U.S. military regiment goes, ah, oh, there's some natives over there. Let's shoot them all. Pop over a hill and go, oh, there's 10,000 of them and 20 of us. Um, you can imagine how that went. But, like, this is the same time period, right? Like, it was dangerous to go out there because of what the U.S. government's policy had been uh, against Native Americans. Yeah. And so there, there's just such a big dichotomy there. Plus, also with Cope and Marsh just throwing dynamite at each other's fossil sites so that the other person can't study those because they're blown up. Right? Yeah, I love that. Just... Who knows? Who knows? Maybe Marsh could have found the first bird with feathers, but instead Cope blew it up with dynamite. Like, we don't know. Yeah, I love that bloody modern paleontology, right? You just slowly chip away at the rock, brush it away with a little paintbrush. Meanwhile, in order to unexcavate a dinosaur in 1800s paleontology, um, simple, just follow the tutorial Oppenheimer made. Right? Like, <laughs> it, it's it's such a difference. I mean, like, I've started volunteering in the prep lab at Petrified Forest. Mm-hmm. And, like, just the, the, like, yeah, here's your microscope, here's your, like, tools and pin vice and everything for it. And it, it's honestly not that bad with the rocks that they have there. I could totally see how with a harder rock, it could be so long to prep out a nice fossil. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Like, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm at the point where with their stuff, especially when I go back next, because... I, I go periodically. It depends on, on my schedule and their schedule. Um, next time I go back, I'm like, okay, I think I can get to the point where I can make some good progress on the fossil I'm preparing. Um, which is just like a random vertebra from one of their other things that they've already described. And they're like, we just need this out of the matrix so that we can have it, not necessarily describe it. Um, but like, it takes time. And like, just thinking back to being like, yeah, we don't have as complex of microscopes and things, and we're just going to wing it. And that's something you absolutely should not wing. <laughs> yeah, meanwhile, in 1800s paleontology, kaboom? Yes, Rico, kaboom. <laughs> oh, I think that's one of the really interesting things, too, about the um, Dinosaur National Monument in the U.S., right? Because I was mentioning earlier, it's like a wall. But they dug out, like, four layers of this wall and kept finding fossils, and then they just went, uh, this is just gonna keep going, so we're just gonna stop. <laughs> like, it, it, and it, and the thing is, it makes it a very impressive sight. Because you walk inside this building that basically houses it, and you go, wow, there's a wall with, like, an Allosaurus tooth, and there's a Brachiosaurus neck, and there's, like, a limb from a Diplodocus, and all this stuff. And it's really cool. <laughs> But, like, there's there's a point where they're just like, no, we can't afford to keep hauling stuff out of this hill. And that is the other part, too, like, that comes back also to the to the accessibility thing. It's like, yeah, like I said, it is a hill, like, right? It's a wall. It is almost vertical. But it's also right next to the edge of that row of hills and mountains. So, like, you don't have to actually go into the mountains to find it. You're on this plane, you get to the foothills of the mountains, and there it is. If it was another 20 miles in, no one would have found it. Welcome to paleontology. That's all I have to say with most of it. No, and like, the, and that is, that is correct, right? Like, paleontology is inherently going to be influenced and biased by what people find and what people find interesting. There's a reason Tyrannosaurus Rex has so many papers about it. And yeah. other dinosaurs, even Allosaurus, right? Plenty of specimens. Allosaurus still has fewer because it's, oh no, but Tyrannosaurus Rex, that's the biggest one. That one's the cool one. I can get money and funding to research that. Yeah, well, hey, how many people are obsessed with T-Rex, buddy? Like, we did this, uh, me and a friend of mine, Gecko, who's been developing a video game called The Time Forgotten which, um, it's a Dinosaur Battle Royale game of sorts. I remember him and I, we did a live stream the other day where it was a tier list of which large theropod has the best chance at beating Tyrannosaurus Rex in a fight. And I remember, like, 90% of the live stream was just him launching into a full-blown rant about how powerful T-Rex is. <laughs> I, mean, I think the really important thing here is I had... During, during Shark Week a few years ago, I had 
Dana Errett and Bobby Bosenecker on the channel to like interview about shark science, paleontology science, mm-hmm. because that's both what they've at least worked on somewhat. And I asked them both times, okay, so like who wins, Megalodon or Leviathan? You know, the giant sperm whale. Yep. And they were both like, eh, hey, you know, and I'm like, so what you're saying is, whichever one has the advantage in bites first wins. And he's, they're like, yeah, that, that's basically it. They're not going to try and fight each other. Yeah. They're going to, if they have the advantage, take that advantage. But otherwise, they're not going to fight because it's too high risk, right? Like, same mm. concept applies to most modern predators, right? Like, mm. wolves can harass a, a grizzly bear. And the grizzly bear will just leave because it doesn't want to fight. It could easily take out two or three of the wolves. But if it gets injured, it's also dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I-, I think that's the real thing with a lot of those ecosystems. The Morrison's a great example. You have Ceratosaurus, which is fairly large. The, the, the main Ceratosaurus you see is the better preserved specimen, which is actually like a sub-adult. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could still get pretty large. You have Allosaurus, you have Saurophaganax, you have Torbosaurus. They're not going to fight each other because they don't want to end up getting injured, even if they win the fight and then die later. <laughs> mm. Well, you see people online saying, um, oh, cheetahs are weak, cheetahs are useless, cheetahs are this, cheetahs are that, because they get their kills stolen. But at the same time, it's like, well, do would you... Even if you're something like a leopard, right, which is supposedly better than the cheetah, would you want to stand your ground against a pack of hyenas or a pack of lions? I don't think you would want to. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm like, I'd agree with that, right? Like, you can't just assume because an animal can get bullied off of its prey that it's mm-hmm. inherently weak. It has its advantages and disadvantages. If something happened in africa that that prevented all of the cape buffalo all of the wildebeest and the only thing that was around is like thompson's gazelles Mm -hmm. suddenly you're gonna have cheetahs doing really really well yeah i mean like it's just it's just a functional difference of what niche they occupy in that environment well hey i remember even reading about um when it comes to cheetahs getting their kills stolen one of the things people don't seem to take into account is that um cheetahs eat very fast and I remember they said that by the time the cheetah is actually forced off a kill by say a pack of vultures, a hyena, a leopard or pride of lions the cheetah's already had enough food to sustain itself so there's no incentive to fight Well I'd agree with that too, especially when you think about like, they have smaller carnassials the the sharpened molars and part of that is because they're just eating the soft meats. They're not there to scavenge and scrape meat off the bone. They're there to hit the, the nutritious organs, hit the nutritious muscles, and bounce. Right? That's, that's the way they're evolutionarily built. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, they fill different niches. An animal doesn't need to be perfect in order to survive. If, if humans were perfect, if I were perfect, I would have bones made out of aluminum because they wouldn't break. They'd be stronger. But yeah. that's not the reality we live in. It just needs to be good enough. And if it's good enough to survive, reproduce, it doesn't matter if it got bullied off that kill, if it still got enough to eat in order to succeed yeah, for I mean, the future. Hey, right, we have the cheetahs in Africa, but cheetahs are also in Asia for a while. And I'm Well, they're even... still there. I think yeah. there's still a population in Iran. Yeah, I believe so, but I think I saw something saying they reckon they'll be extinct in the next decade. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a large part of that is I, <laughs> the Asiatic cheetah has the issue that African cheetahs are going to have in 50 years of they're all inbred. Yeah. <laughs> right, like, it, it's, it, they're, I hate to say it because I love cheetahs. Cheetahs were one of my favorite animals growing up. They are functionally a dead taxa because mm. there's just not genetic diversity. Unless someone is able to significantly change unless there is a significant undertaking to move different individuals around in order to artificially increase the genetic diversity Mm. boy i remember i've even seen people say that cheetahs are weak cheetahs are this that whatever because of the inbreeding and all that but uh if i remember correctly that's also a problem affecting i believe tigers leopards and lions so, 
for me it's like, well, you might as well bring it up with the lions, tigers, and leopards as well. Or what, are you just hating on the cheetah because your favorite YouTuber did? No, and that's totally fair. I think a big part of it is the populations of at least leopards and lions from what I know are still the ranges of the different populations are still larger. So there's the potential for more genetic diversity and it could develop that way in the future. Cheetahs specifically are so limited in their range that each population is artificial, almost artificially at least, um, limited as far as its genetic diversity. Whereas lions, you could go, well, these two populations in a few more years, if we do the right conservation work, could touch. You could get genetic flow through there. They could manage. It's just the this, this simple numbers of cheetahs and the fact that there was, already an, there was already a historical bottleneck when they migrated into Africa mm-hmm. from Eurasia. And that bottleneck of here's this little bit of the population getting across the Sinai Peninsula, and now that became all of the cheetahs in Africa. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think that's more the emphasis on the cheetah genetic bottleneck. Well, another thing I was going to point out when it comes to the cheetah and uh, how it's weak and this and that, well, we have the American cheetah, which, as far as I know, isn't an actual real cheetah, but pretty closely related, both of them being close relatives of the puma. And, well, yeah. that thing lived in America for a while, so for me it's like, well, if the cheetah's weak and useless, then why did another cat convergently evolve a similar body? Well, and that's the really interesting thing. People have done more studies on... Morassinonyx is the genus name of the American cheetah, but I'll just use American cheetah. Yeah, um, sounds cooler. <laughs> like, you get them in caves in the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon has a lot of limestone through it. That makes caves. <laughs> That's a geology discussion. But um, and it's like, well, if these are supposed to be like cheetahs, what the hell are they doing in a cave on a cliffside? And it is flat up and above those, but it's like, maybe these things were living more like mountain lions. And then there's um, some studies done on the stable isotopes of collagen in bones from 10-ish thousand years ago in Natural Trap Cave, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And based on the isotopes in that collagen versus the other organisms that fell into that same cave, it seems like they were eating a slightly more diverse diet than just the fast animal in North America, the pronghorn. Mm -hmm. Um. One of these ideas has been that the pronghorn antelope, which isn't an antelope, it's its own group. It's really weird. Um, but regardless, it's um, it's so fast, the modern pronghorn, because it had to run from the, the American cheetah. <sighs> what they found is it ate basically the same amount of pronghorn as the American lion did. It ate a very similar diet to the American lion. Maybe slightly leaner, not as much buffalo, but enough to be like yeah there, there's no reason to say it was a specialist on running fast it seems like it was just kind of a generic big big to moderate sized cat wow. um like not, not 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 necessarily the same way as like an american lion would have been but at least enough to go yeah it was it was, it was a puma that was slightly more adapted for open areas honestly it seems like the carnivore was extremely diverse in america at that time right oh because you had there, there's there like almost the entire. I, I feel like a lot of the early felidae, um, or felinae, whichever mm-hmm. taxonomy is confusing. I feel like a lot of them did start in North America. Cats specifically may have started in Central Asia. C- yeah, canid, canid, carnivoran evolution is wild. Because it's just kind of like, we have some of these other carnivore mammal groups. Um, and then suddenly, carnivore, modern carnivores evolve, and they're just almost everywhere. Almost instantly. <laughs> well, I remember being set back thinking, right, with the sort of stuff you'd see in North America during that period of time. Uh, you had, right, American lion, American cheetah, mountain lion, dire wolf, actual wolves, uh, bloody... Ancestors of coyotes, bo- bobcats, lynxes. Uh, A lot of those are the same species bears. as coyotes. Oh. Yeah, uh, Canis latrons, I think it is. 
I think I'm pretty sure it's the same species. Huh. But yeah. But yeah, then you have short-faced bear, the ancestors of modern-day bears, like black bears and grizzlies. And then you even have giant jaguars, if I remember correctly. And then on top of that, Smilodon. <laughs> well, and a lot of things were just heavier bodied. Again, again, this goes back to this goes back to like what I was talking about with like colder temperatures, mm-hmm. increasing body size of organisms. Because if you look at what is it, Karchner Caverns in southern Arizona, mm-hmm. wonderful caverns. Visit if you get the chance. Um, but they have fossils there, and they found you know ground sloths and things. But they also talked about some of the other things that have washed it. They essentially got washed into this cave and fossilized. And it's like, oh yeah, by the way, they had a road runner that was 50% larger than modern day road runners, which, you know, it's a type of ground bird, it's predatory. But it's like, yeah, it just, they were just inherently 50% larger or so. Because it was colder, maybe? Like, it's an interesting question to ask, like, why were these organisms able to just be larger? Like, almost everything even 10,000 years ago, was larger. And is part of that cold? Is part of that human intervention just wiping out the larger ones? Or what? Like, a, it's a very interesting question to ask. <laughs> Bloody 50% larger roadrunners. I just imagined Wild E. <clears throat> Wild e Coyote just being set back like, hang on, you said what? <laughs> like, and, and, I mean, I, I think also Wild E. Coyote, for most people who don't just see roadrunners every time they go down to their parents in the desert, uh <laughs> roadrunners modern day roadrunners not that big right like still a good sized bird mm-hmm. but they're not that big they're maybe maybe 0.25 meters in length what is that let me let me let me run some math and then do meters to inches conversion um fortunately i have that built into my calculator on my phone so i can do that really easy Okay, I just looked it up, and it says greater road runners are about two feet tall. Yeah, that's not that big. Yeah, not that big at all. <laughs> I mean, like for a for a bird, sure, maybe you could argue it, but like that's half the size of a chicken that lays your eggs, right? Like, I mean, as long as this, if, this is also coming from me, someone who has a, a mother in law who raises chickens, so. Those are also very specific chickens that it's like, yeah, it'd probably be about half that that size. They're wonderful birds. They're so, so interesting. Like you see them and you can just kind of feel like the no, like you just did what what like Velociraptor did, but smaller. <laughs> just walking along. Yeah. I mean, and like like I said, they're predatory, right? Like they eat rattlesnakes and lizards and, and things, right? Like they don't just Go after seeds. Technically, they're a species of cuckoo, which is also fun. <laughs> Animals are interesting sometimes. I love, yeah. one, I love one thing. I, mean, like, da- I love one thing. I remember my dad told me about um bird here. Right, we have crows in Australia, and also a species of native pigeon. Uh, I believe it's called something like the crested pigeon, but I know it as the top knot. That's what I call it. That's what pretty much everyone where I live calls it. It's known as the top knot because it has that weird crest on its head. And I remember um, my dad said he saw four crows, which I believe he said he later went out and hunted because they're just bullying all the wildlife. So he shot them all, or most of them. I right, mean, like in bases, I'm totally in in favor yeah. of doing that with. To be fair, yeah. Um, like right, you, so even. They, they were I'm chasing sound the, terrible. They were there chasing are certain the, invasives on like the island of Hawaii that I am okay with that some people have talked about and some people have been upset about people uh, uh, targeting yeah. for getting rid of invasives. That's all I'm going to say about that. But yeah, with um, with these crows, they were chasing off this top knot and he was watching it. And um, I remember him saying he saw this bloody wedgetail eagle, right? Largest species of eagle in Australia. Just come out of nowhere. Just hit this top knot and then take off pretty much take up into the sky at a pretty much near vertical angle after coming within like six feet of the ground and then both him and the crows were sat there looking like what the hell just happened as we see this top knot just flying away (laughs) i mean that's one of those things that you can't like 
there's so much that happens in nature that we just don't catch or appreciate. Like, I was actually driving earlier today. And it's like, oh, there's a deer crossing the road. That's great. Oh, cool. It's a mule deer. Oh, cool. There's a few more. Drive a little further. Why does it look like there's two right next to one another? And as I drive by, I slow down and I'm like, oh, those are just two male deer trying to fight each other for mating rights. And it's like, yeah, this is just something that's happening in my town. Essentially, just right off the road. (laughs) Okay, sure. (laughs) Like, I'm not here to stop it, but like... Uh, I love it. it I love the way Australia. ecosystems interact with cities are so interesting. I love it here in Australia where you get the videos of stuff like kangaroos fighting on the streets. <laughs> right, and okay, as, as an Australian, I need to ask you, are you afraid of American wildlife? All I'm going to say is you guys have bears. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because like that's what I keep hearing is like Americans are always like, oh, Australia is so scary. Everything is venomous, and then, then we hear Australians being like, you guys have bears and mountain lions and wolves, and like I, I just don't feel safe there. And I'm like, God, we need to swap because I would feel a thousand times safer also in Australia. Well, wait, most of it, I've. I've gotten way too close to venomous animals without being bitten that I'm like, no, Australia, that's my shit. <laughs> Sorry, that's my jam. Yeah, for well, me, I... try, try and cut out me swearing if you can. Uh, it's okay, I swear a lot myself, so you don't have to worry too much. But, I mean, if um... I say hell, fine. Yeah. But yeah, here in Australia, right, it's like, if there's a snake, just leave it alone. Or right with a snake, you can fight it off with a stick. Or, you know, like one old guy who went viral, you can just kick the thing in the head. Meanwhile, what are you meant to do with a mountain lion? Uh, a mountain lion you can fight. Mountain lions aren't normally that big that you're going to be totally screwed. Mm -hmm. You'll have to be slightly lucky, but you'll make it more... With with a slight amount of luck, you'll make it more difficult than the mountain lion is going to try. Mm. Now, if I were in Indonesia and it was a tiger, no, you're you're SOL. You're you're done. Rip. It's one of those things where you look and it's like, I'm staring down a 200 kilo beast. I don't think I'm going to see my wife and kids (laughs) again. (laughs) Yeah, right? Like, and like I said, especially with the, uh, the, the, like, if you were to, like, Indonesia, India, uh, Bangladesh, like, with tigers, a tiger is a thousand percent more dangerous than a mountain lion. And a mountain lion can still kill you. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, like, a mountain lion, if you know you are fighting a mountain lion, me as a moderately physically fit adult male, Right, like, I could make it more difficult than it's worth to the mountain lion. A tiger is just, it's done. Rip. Yeah. Us it, in chat. I remember me and Gecko, we ended up uh, watching the f- documentary Valley of the T-Rex by Jack Horner uh, about a week or so ago now, probably. Right? Most of it ended up uh, just being Horner. us. Most of it just ended up being us making pedophile jokes, as you may have guessed. But, um... <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, I wasn't anticipating you saying that, but also you're not incorrect. <laughs> yeah. And like I've heard I've heard from other paleontologists that that was a poor decision on his part, in part because there's more nuance behind it. But then I've also heard other paleontologists be like, yeah, he kind of just went and like, oh, you're a woman in paleontology? Sure. I could come up and just put my arm around you, so but you're yeah, not wrong, um, is the moral of the story. <laughs> but yeah, um, so besides all the pedophile jokes, um, if I remember correctly, there was this part where they were talking about Deinonychus, and I remember Gecko went to me, you know, I think I'd rather take on Deinonychus than a mountain lion. And I'm just sat there going like, are you sure? Right, and we look up the weight, and he sat, th- and we sat there like, okay, they're pretty similar in size. Uh, no, I think I'd rather take on the Deinonychus. And I'm sat there, and I go to him, look up the bite force. And then he sat there looking around. Right, it pops up the thing in Newton's. You, and then he's- you, you guys, you guys found the um, God, what is that? Paul Gignac. You found the Gignac study, didn't you? I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. But I grabbed one of my books, and it said that Deinonychus had a bite force of like 830 something kilos which is like 1800 that, that, that's pounds. That's the Gignac study. Yeah. Like 
close to 1,900 pounds <laughs> versus 450-something from the mountain line. I remember he just went straight away, yeah, no, nah, I'd rather take on the mountain line. Well, I mean, I think a lot of it, too, is they're similar but different, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right? Like, if you think about the claws on Donaticus, they're larger because that's their main grapple point, right? Mm-hmm. They just mainly use those one big claws as their grapple point. <laughs> But yeah, I, l- I love that. Just so, looks at the bike force comparison. Yeah, no, I'd rather take on a mountain line. <laughs> right, but like, j- just take it step by step, though. Like, if it comes at you, what is it going to do? It is going to try and grapple and pin you. Okay, mm-hmm. how does mountain lion do that? Well, its front claws each have, or its front paws each have five large claws. Mm-hmm. Maybe four, because one of those is a do claw, isn't it? Four large claws that are, you know going to cut into you but not get as deep right but still be able to manhandle you fairly well Donaticus does the same thing with its feet with large claws that are going to hit your internal organs yeah that's already going to be a disadvantage right um and then okay cool like how do they bite right because like my hypothetical is if I'm ever jumped by a mountain lion I'm just going to shove my my hand into its mouth let it choke on that until it gives up. Cool. That works for the mountain lion because it needs to bite and hold, you know, cut off the windpipe, all that kind of stuff. Donaticus can bite and it can pull out and slash because it has these really serrated teeth. So each one of its bites causes you to bleed more. You can't just do that with a Donaticus. Like, they, they, are, they are similar, but different. And that I think is very important to understand about their hunting strategies. They're like big cats in that they pin their prey down, but their biting method for killing is different. It, it reminds me of um, one thing I remember coming across this dude who decided to make this bear proof suit. His idea being so that way he could, so that way they could study bears better because the suit would allow him to get pretty close. And all I'm just sat back thinking when I was looking at this bear proof suit, as he called it. Is um I'm just sat back thinking of all the fight scenes from Pacific Rim. <laughs> like you can imagine already. <laughs> right? Like a polar like even if, if you're trying to study a polar bear or a grizzly bear, right? Like a bear proof suit will stop you from being killed. Mm. You're not gonna have a fun time. It's like a bomb suit. A bomb suit will protect you from being killed. You're not gonna have a fun time if the bomb goes off though. Like yeah. You're, you're you're taking proof and applying it to comfortable. You could you could imagine it already in the sense of using it like the, the Jaegers from Pacific Rim, right? Like Grizzly Bear escapes from the zoo, goes on a rampage. They helicopter him in in this bloody thing, <laughs> armed with a tranquilizer gun, and he's sat there wrestling with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like. You'd just be set back thinking, just normal day in America, I'm going to wrestle a grizzly bear in a mech suit. Yeah. Yeah, like, bear, bears on their own are already mm. enough. Right? Like, most bears aren't going to bo- bother you. Nine, 99 times out of 100, bears aren't going to bother you. You know, gra- grab your, your bear spray. Bear spray is more effective than a firearm at deterring a bear. Mm. Um, like, which I think is just one of those very important statistics people who want to go out and hike around the US depending on where you are mm. um, should know like we have bears here but they're black bears they're not they're not looking to eat you if you're up further in the Rockies or up towards Alaska like then you might have problems but um, yeah. like you know if, it, if, if a bear decides either A threat to the cubs or B your food yeah, like, you're going to have a problem. Yeah, for me, it's one of those things where I look at it, and even with other things, like uh, lions in Africa and tigers in Asia, it's one of those things where it's like, um, if I were to go out h- hiking or go traveling out in one of these areas, especially if I know it's an area where there's going to be a lot of common uh, areas where I'll see tigers or um, any sort of large predator, it's one of those things where it's like carry bear spray, carry a rifle or something, 12-gauge shotgun. Well, I know, I, I, I know when, um, mm. God, who was it, Neil Shubin, who described TikTok, mm-hmm. was talking about going up to, uh, um, none of it, to, uh, I think it was Ellesmere Island and none of it, 
to to try and find the fossil right you talked about like yeah legally we're so far north we have to carry a firearm in case there's a polar bear um, yeah and i'm pretty sure like even churchill canada which is on the southern side of the hudson bay it's like yeah it's illegal to lock your car because mm-hmm. if there's a polar bear and someone needs to get into your car or into your house in order to not get eaten by a polar bear, they need to be able to get in. It is illegal to lock your doors. Yeah. Well, hey, I remember... Which when... polar bears are a whole different monster, but... Oh, hey, I remember talking with my dad about bears here and there, and I remember him saying he saw some documentary thing of this dude traveling in the Arctic Circle with people who work there and all that. And I remember one of the guys working there, I remember him saying he went something like, up oh, polar bear, time to leave now. And I remember... The, the dude they were with, he goes something like, "What? What are you on about? Why? Why do we need to leave now? Now it's all it's oh far it's a uh, far away in the distance. Why do we need to leave?" And that's where the guys working there went to him. This if we can see it, it can see us, and there's no other meat around in the entire area besides us. It's gonna want to eat us. <laughs> Right, like, yeah, and I think that's one of those things, especially with polar bears, right, is, like, it is so, it is a desert with, it is a desert surrounded by water, but it's all salt water, so you can't drink it, right? Yeah. But it's, like, there's nothing, unless you can catch whatever is on the bottom of the ocean, which, depending where you are in the Arctic, could be, you know, 50, 60 feet down. If you're not a seal, you're not getting it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Polar bears are there to make a living on the ice where it is very difficult to make a living. Yeah. Like, I would 100% be like, yes, sure. If, if I were on Neil Shubin's thing going out to, to find new fossils of Tiktaalik, I'd be like, yes, give me that rifle. I'm like, I'm going to carry it the entire time because I'm paranoid. I'm good at being paranoid. Yeah, for me, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't care what you tree-loving hippies say about animal <laughs> conservation, I am not dying. I mean, I think that's one of those really important things about animal conservation, too, right? Like, yeah. the wildlife management class I took was specifically about essentially being a game warden in the U.S., mm-hmm. um, for lack of a better term. And it's like, yeah, you need a you need to balance all of these groups, whether it be the hippie, we shouldn't hunt at all, whether it be the, like, we should just shoot them all, you know, we need to shoot all the wolves kind of guy. Um, you need to balance all of these ideas and come to a consistent management plan. Yeah. Um, and, like, I, I think that was really important for me for understanding, like, listen, there is, when it comes to wildlife, there is leeway and different strategies you can take in order to mitigate the effects that are the worst. Mm-hmm. Right. And like even bears, right? There's a handful of bear attacks in the US a year, right? Like mm-hmm. 99.9% of the time you may you may see a bear. The rest of the time you're not going to be attacked by it, right? Like mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things where I totally understand the paranoia. I was bitten on the face by a dog when I was like two and a half and that has emotionally scarred me for years where i'm just like nope i don't like dogs um like that that thought of animal attack just keeps gnawing at the back of my head and i'm a little paranoid about it right Mm. and like that's fine that's just where i am um but overall nothing's gonna happen Mm. right like you can go you can go take that walk nothing's you're gonna be fine Right. And like, especially throughout most of the U.S., like most of those organisms have been wiped out, especially on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Um, It's certainly the Rockies. You know, there's more issues. I know on one of my geology trips that they were like, yeah. So just keep in mind, if you see a moose up here, get behind a tree and just stay there. Um, And again, that was specifically we, we saw moose tracks and moose poop on that trip. Fortunately, we didn't see any actual moose because, you know, moose can be angry and it's a 1,000 pound deer that's going to kick the hell out of you. Yeah, I remember but that's reading. Just what it is. I came across someone on Twitter called Herbivorized Predators, where, if I remember correctly, right, that saying, has to be a troll account. I reckon has to it be must be. Because... I refuse. I refuse to believe they're a real person. <laughs> but yeah, um, 
I remember a couple of people pointing out it must be a troll account because uh, they have this website linked there and when you click on it, it leads to a error 404 page. But I do recall actually clicking that link once and it did actually take me to a proper website. So I am a bit on the fence about whether or not it's a troll account. But anyway, I remember they put out this tweet where it was something like the good thing about herbivorizing predators is uh, we don't have to worry about animal maulings. To which everyone was replying saying, you obviously haven't seen deer in rut or elephant in musks. Uh, elephants in musk. Right, and like, even just moose on any day, right? Like, I'm glad we don't have them here. But it's like, that's a 1,000 pound animal that will just screw your day up for no good reason. Boy, even but- the elk that we have, and like, even the elk we have here, those are still 500 pound deer, give or take. Um, math. Sorry, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep in mind a more diverse audience than just me. So 500 pounds, uh, mass pounds, 500. That's 226 kilograms. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 220 kilogram deer. Like, even if you're just trying to drive to work, like <laughs> you'll have to stop for those. And in the winter, we get herds of them moving through. You know. 40, 50 strong, where it's just like, yeah, you just, just got to stop for like three minutes while they meander across the road. Good luck. I love those videos like, you, you see Like, you can't of, go out and fight one of those. I love those videos you see of morons where they're like, ah, oh, yes, let's get close to the one-ton bison in front of us, capable of killing grizzly bears by driving <clears> them into <throat> the ground. We can definitely pet that thing. I remember taking a road trip with my family through South Dakota, where one of the um, bison preserves is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like, okay, this fencing is here to keep the bison out. Like, you can get out, you can get food, that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And there's some dude and his kid who looks about the same age as I was at the time. I think I was seven, right? And my dad's like, I would never. Like... There was a guy who was gored to death the week before we were there. And my dad just like, no, like I would never take you out there. Like not worth it. Never worth it. It's not happening. It reminds me of a picture. I I wasn't, I wasn't asking to go out there or anything, but he was just like, no, I'm keeping you safe. Damn it. It reminds me of a picture I saw of this, um, this sign someone had up on like some property where it was something like, do not jump the fence unless you can run across it in nine seconds, because the bull can do it in ten. <laughs> I've at least seen jokes like that, right? Like, where yeah. it's like, no, don't... <laughs> what is it? Uh, F around and find out? Yeah. Like, there, there's certain points where you need to accept that, right? Like, you see a grizzly bear and her cubs, you don't F around. You just back away. You just keep backing away. Oh, what's that? You got you, you got to go over a log backwards. Just keep backing away. You just you just keep going, right? Like, don't tempt fate. Mm. You can tempt fate a number of times, but the number of times for each person varies wildly. <laughs> I don't want to find out what my number is. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather um, stay away from bloody bison, grizzly bears, and all that. I mean, the worst in Australia besides camels and uh, wild horses that you have to deal with is by kangaroo. Although in saying that, you can get some massive kangaroos. I mean, yeah, right? Like, there there are very few kangaroo I would fight, and for very specific reasons. Like, if I was in Australia, and my kid went wandering off, and there was a kangaroo over there, I'd be like, whoa, whoa, hang on. We're pulling, we're pulling you away if the kangaroo tried to square up and be like, listen. Yeah. Like, I'm a- kid, let me at least get my kid away, and then I'll square up. But, I'm, like, I ain't here for you. I remember seeing one video where it was from, like, some documentary thing. I can't remember the dude's name. I think it was Malcolm Douglas, some Australian explorer, I think he is. Where it was of, like, uh, if a kangaroo does decide to square off with you. And um, one of the things he showed off was just, like, crouch down. Right? Because, well, they're used to seeing us the same way they see other members of, our spe- of their species. So, when you're sat there standing up, it looks like a threat, right, like you want to fight, so just crouch down and they'll be more inclined to back down themselves, because it's like, okay, not a threat. I don't know how true that is, 
But like, no, no, no. no. The, and like that sounds correct though, right? Like yeah. a kangaroo if it fights you, it's not fighting you for predation or anything, right? Yeah. Like if you can make it stop thinking you're a threat, you're fine. Like the reason moose are so aggressive or seem so aggressive is because a there's been twenty ish thousand years of evolution telling them that people who stand up upright are dangerous. Mm. Um, a little bit more uh, based on most recent studies of when humans arrived in North America. But it's like they have that going on, but also they're 1,000 pounds. They are the largest animals in the forests of North America. They can fight whatever the hell they want and have no repercussions 99% of the time. They don't care. It it doesn't matter to them. Right. For me, it's like when I look at most of these things and it's like, um, this thing kills grizzly bears. Do you want to mess with it? (laughs) That's all I have to say. Just this thing kills grizzly bears. Yeah, yeah. And, like, with kangaroos, like, the red kangaroo, right? That's, like, the largest herbivore, native herbivore, in Australia right now, right? Yeah. Like, how did it manage? It fought stuff bigger than it. It fought Megalania to make sure it didn't get jumped or whatever, right? Um, Megalania? Uh, like what is it, Kanaka? Sorts of stuff. But- yeah, right? Like, it, it is the perfect size for a large predator to eat, frankly. Mm. It's not going to go down, damn it. It's not going to just sit there and be like, oh, you're the same size as me? Clearly you're not a threat. <laughs> right? Like, Thalacoleo was still pretty good size. I'm not going to say it was massive, but like, mm. it was at least fairly large size. From what we know of Thalacoleo's biology, it had good, strong front arms to pull things down with. Which means, if it was coming in for an attack, it would be more upright. There could be some instinctual evolution there where it's just, hey, upright thing, fight it. And then that also turns in and adapts to their just, you know, uh, uh, socio sexual selection uh, interaction, right? Where it's like it's a, it's a social interaction within the species. Where yeah, I don't think fight you want upright to thing. Me- don't think you want to mess with Phylac or Leo. Just sent you a meme I made about that. <laughs> no, 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 I see it, I see it. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things where it's like... It's so hard to say this with fossil animals, and I love the idea. And it's just a matter of what specific feature you're trying to study, right? Like, bite force, Thylaco Leo, having a stronger bite, I would totally buy. Because... Slightly shorter skull. Mm-hmm. It's more squat of a skull. The tooth pattern is going to be a little bit more focused. Yeah. So I could totally buy that for bite force specifically. The thing is, again, they don't need to be perfect. They just need to be good enough. If you went back 5 million years and just introduced lions into Australia, who knows what would happen, right? Mm. Like, they could they could very well be end up occupying different niches and living the way leopards and lions do today it's it's i love this idea of comparing things mm-hmm. but it's just one of those things where it's like i sorry I bumped, hang on i bumped my my microphone uh mm-hmm. a bit um I, I love this idea of different fossil organisms and modern organisms fighting and seeing who would win and i think you need to take it by a case-by-case basis because they're built for their environments yeah an african lion may not succeed in australia ten thousand years ago thylaco leo may not have succeeded in africa today although i i would say i think thylaco leo would do better just simply because of marsupial breeding uh mm. patterns <clears throat> Oh, it reminds me or of, they can um, have like three ready to go at once. It reminds me of um, right with the cryptozoology thing and me taking an interest in the Australian cats. Because of some, a bit of minority of reports, some have actually theorized that maybe Phylacoleo is behind the sightings, that maybe Phylacoleo is still alive. Personally, I doubt this myself because, um, well, there's been livestock killings attributed to the uh big cats supposedly lurking in Australia, and um, 
if I remember correctly, the bite marks on these cat on these uh, livestock killings uh, match that of stuff such as pumas, leopards, and jaguars, and they look nothing like Phylaca Leo's teeth. Uh, well, yeah, least, the, like Phylaca Leo yeah. had very specific teeth. You would know. Yeah, that, I think. So for me, that's one of those things where it's like uh, that sort of brings it down in terms of could it be Phylaca Leo? But one of the things I'd like I found a bit interesting is. There's legends of a marsupial predator prowling northern Queensland called the uh, Queensland tiger. Uh, it's it's not the drop bear. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I one hundred percent thought you were gonna try and get me with the drop bear. No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> right, but um, some have also theorized this thing to be Phylaca Leo. And some have also theorized, based on, again, another couple of the reports, that it might be a short-faced form of mainland phylocene. I'll just send you some artwork of the Queensland tiger so you can see what I'm talking about. It's a pretty interesting animal. It, it sounds vaguely familiar. Um, here's some artwork someone did to uh, mock it up to look like a, a file like a Leo. Mm-hmm. Well, I know there's been at least... Yeah... I, I think I've seen that art before. I think... So there was a paper out a few years ago yep. where... Not Thylaka Leo, sorry. Um, Tasmanian Tiger. Mm -hmm. Thylaka... Was, was it a Thylaka or is it just Tasmanian Tiger? Different Tasmanian. scientific name. I think its scientific name was Phylocinus Sinocephalus. That sounds more right. Tasmanian Tiger, regardless... Um, I think knowing there's been some sight, alleged sightings in Tasmania that have come to nothing, there's apparently been some in um, on the island of New Guinea which I would put more weight on. Yeah, and there's even been... And that could be comparable that. to this. From what I also know though, with a study on the Tasmanian tiger a few years ago, based on its body mass it wouldn't be going after large prey it would be targeting prey mostly smaller than itself mm. yeah um, i remember um, th 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 there's a kind of trend in mammal evolution where once you get over 25 pounds feel free to add the the, the kilogram conversion in post because i just don't remember it off the top of my head mm -hmm. um 25 pounds it's gonna be something around like 12 kilograms or something yep um Anyway, around that weight, once you start getting over that weight regularly, then mammalian predators start to target prey larger than themselves. Which means, based on what we know of Tasmanian tiger body sizes, they would have mostly been targeting smaller prey than themselves. So, like, chickens, sure. Sheep, not so much. Yeah, um, which is a large part of the reason they were hunted so much. This thing, if I remember correctly, has also had livestock killings attributed to it and not just that but it's even been known i think there was this one farmer where he reported losing several dogs to this uh, queensland tiger so um well one of the things i was sat back thinking and i remember even talking with a friend of mine on discord called nature enjoyer about this where i reckon the queensland tiger Ouch. if it's a real animal is actually what's known as a well i believe what would be called a chimera where what you're looking at is several different animals being lumped in as the Queensland tiger, because some of the reports uh, give something <coughs> more along the lines of Phylaca Leo, and then others give something more like a Phylocene, and some are simply just quolls. So it could be the case it's well, a, maybe no, even a large I, species of quoll. I, I like that idea. I also like the idea of... They lost some dogs to it. Yeah. Are there reasons they say they lost dogs to it, and is it specifically bite marks with wide-set canines? Because I would then compare the width of those canines to the bites of venomous snakes in Australia. Because potentially, that farmer and others, unfortunately, just had venomous snakes bite their dogs, and that would leave two distinct canine, fake canine marks, right? But those could be the fangs. Um, envenomating the, the dog, right? Like, I, I think that could be an interesting investigation. That's something that, if you're going to look at this, you need to compare. Mm. 
if you're going to try and compare it in a, in a heavily scientific way. Uh, just give me a sec, I'll be back, just gonna go to the bathroom. No worries, you're good. Okay, sounds like I, someone, I hear someone getting into a desk. Yep, uh, one, thing I will I... Just, one thing I will just say about the uh, Queensland Tiger, and this is the main reason why I've sort of become interested in cryptozoology, is... Um, no, all good. Uh, if I remember correctly, since the 1950s, sightings have actually dropped off drastically of the Queensland Tiger. To the point that mm -hmm. um, cryptozoologist Malcolm Smith, author of the book Bunyips and Bigfoots, actually doubts modern Queensland tiger reports because he reckons the animal is most likely extinct by this point, if it was real. So it is pretty saddening because, well, as I said earlier, <laughs> some reckon it could be Phylaca Leo or a close relative. So, f for you know, this might have been the only animal of Phylaca Leo in a day to have actually made it into modern times. Yeah. I mean, and, like, that's one of those things, too, right? Like, it's really easy to say, oh, well, we should know everything. There yeah. are still so many densely forested or otherwise hard-to-access areas that something like this could still feasibly exist up until yeah. at least recently. Um, yeah. Again, like I mentioned, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. or, or I mentioned New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, as a country, has a thousand some odd languages. Right? Like it is that dense that these peoples who have lived there for thousands of years have not interacted enough to have a single consistent language. Mm -hmm. Right? And like they can still come together and make their own country, all that kind of stuff. But I think that really speaks to the broader biodiversity that we may not be seeing in certain places right so like australia if there was something like this it would need enough food to survive it would need enough water to survive it's going to be in you know northern what is it northern queensland is where it's yeah. more forested in australia yeah um and then new guinea as well right because those used to be connected when the, the sea levels were lower um i think if you want to find cryptic species go to new zealand drop some some good game cams around talk to the indigenous peoples that are around ask them what they're seeing yeah um which i don't know how complex that would be right like mm. i'm sure it's going to be complex to talk to those governments i think also you could go to some of the harder to reach regions of nepal right the more forested regions in the valleys of nepal huh. um as well as Places like in certain parts of like the the Congolese jungle, um, the where the Niger River Delta comes out, right? Like, I, I, if you're gonna find a cryptic vertebrate species, I think it's gonna be there. Mm. Um, for me, it's just the case because, of because because of the wealth that exists in South America for gold, minerals, other things. I don't think you're gonna find it there. I think your best bets are going to be certain parts of the Congo, maybe the Niger Delta, mm. and I mean, then Southeast Asia, Indonesia, into New Guinea and, and Australia. I mean, it's the case of like a follow the native reports because, well, these pe people would know the area the most out of anyone because they've lived in the area themselves. So, well, hey, yeah, remember. Right? If I remember correctly, even the aboriginals of Australia have reported the Queensland tiger, which would seem to add some validity, although there is some I mean, I'm, I'm not opposed to that, honestly. Yeah. Well, hey, I remember bloody, um, the friend I talked with about the Queensland tiger, Nature Enjoyer, I think I've pretty much convinced him that it is a very much possible cryptid to exist. Like, he went from being, nah, can't be anything, to... Uh, if I remember, he's now got it in his top five list of most pop possible cryptids, which I found sort of funny. I, I think it could be valid. Mm. I think you would need to move away from like Darwin and the major cities in their the area. Yeah, and and I think this comes back to kind of what you were talking about with me about oh bears are scary, and I'm just sitting here like. Crocodiles are scary. What the hell are you on about, right? <laughs> like, I, I I think they serve a similar 
place in the psyche of trying to explore those areas where it's just like this is an unstoppable force of nature in animal form right yeah. like if a grizzly wants to to make you dead you're out of luck if a saltwater crocodile wants to make you dead you're out of luck mm. right um and so i think you know obviously take precautions and all that kind of stuff i think i think people know well enough how to deal with both of those organisms in order to take precautions no matter where they are if you're in australia though i think just go go not necessarily trailblaze and make your own trail but go out to some of the more remote trails that are lesser driven mm. pop some trail cameras out there and see what you find Great. so at least at worst Maybe you find some endangered species of quoll is still alive, right? Like, hmm. you have options there for research for just general endangered threatened species. Hmm. I, I think that's where you should you should be at. Hmm. Oh, um. Anyway, sorry, you go. Well, I was just gonna say, uh, for me, it is the case of like there is a lot of Australia that isn't really all that explored, so who knows what's hiding out there? Yeah, so uh, for being interested in checking out anything further on the Queensland tiger, you have the books Australian Big Cats and the Natural History of Panthers and Bunyips and Bigfoot updated second edition by Malcolm Smith. But both Those... have... Yeah? You go. You go. You had more. You uh, go. Both are um pretty big books. I think uh, Bunyips and Bigfoots is 300-something pages. Australian Big Cats, 450. So, uh, those, okay, sorry, no cutting back, it, I, sorry, I was interrupting your spiel on them, so I felt like I needed to stop, <laughs> rewind, to make sure you can get that single recording down for uh, your own sake. It's, it's okay, <laughs> but yeah, um, um, go, on, those, go on. Those sound interesting, I'm not yeah. sure if I'm going to be able to get to them soon, just because I'm applying to grad schools and hmm. probably going to end up doing grad school and trying to study specific things and being root end up reading almost only scientific papers from here on out yeah. <laughs> for the next few years so but those do sound interesting i do love these ideas right like i am people talk about cryptozoology and i am a i'm trying to say it politely like in, in a way that makes sense to me polite to me um i am a cryptozoologist who hedges on conventional science right mm -hmm. like could there be a large predator in the queensland forests sure i'm not going to commit to what it is we be very thorough about what we do for example what i mentioned to you with the um the snake bites check you know thing mm -hmm. widths and why these people thought oh our dog was killed by this well is it the width of a death adder it's yeah. probably a death adder then right like there's there's different balances we can do there um that said totally feasible to think there is still a moderately sized um mammalian predator in that region because it's hard to access right like when we think about mammalian predators in the u.s as an example wolves used to span across the entire country and now they're in a few isolated spots because of where people went and the places they still exist are where people don't go. Mm. That could be the, the, the northern Queensland territory for, uh, for, for these sorts of organisms. I'm not going to say they're cats for sure. Could be any other kind of mammal. Could be an, uh, some relative of Thylaca leo for all I know. Right? Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not opposed to the idea. And I think it is very interesting. And I think people should be investigating this. Because... If we can understand this, we can get genetics, we can do the, the, the kind of genetic studies to understand the evolution of different groups. We can also understand the biology of what was happening in Australia in that region, which is fairly poor for fossils. Most of the fossils we have from Australia, from my understanding, come from other parts of Australia. Um, well, for me, with cryptozoology, the main thing I have with it is, well, um, well, I hear constantly this whole thing of, like, 
half of all life on Earth will be wiped out by 2050, X amount of this animal species will be gone by 2030, this animal will be, will be extinct by next month. And for me, it's like, after hearing about that for a while, I find it pretty stupid when the same people who say this and that and blah 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 blah, uh, look and hear, hey, maybe there's big cats roaming Australia, and they just look and go, oh, that's fucking stupid. Pardon my language. Right, but for me, it's like, well, we're never no we're never gonna know everything. There's always new species being discovered, so what's to say there possibly couldn't be a large predator roaming Queensland, for example? I'm not saying that yeah, means and like, 100% there are, but it's worth investigating. And it's one of those no, and I agree. And I think Queensland as a as an area, right? Heavily forested, hard to reach for certain regions of it. And, and like New Guinea, again, same thing. Very hard to reach for major portions of it. If you told me, oh, hey, there's a polar bear, the largest carnivore on land in Nebraska, I'd go, no flipping way. Because you could go out to anywhere on Nebraska a flat plain where you you can see the horizon in 360 degrees. There's no mountains, there's no trees, there's nothing. And I'd go, flipping where? Where is this polar bear? Yeah. Right? Now, if you told me, hey, there's a polar bear slightly outside of its normal range in, you know, just outside of Nome, you know, towards Anchorage, let's say, hmm. I could go, yeah, maybe. There's a lot of forest here. It'd still be bright white, but, like, it's a bear. It'll find things to eat. Maybe not necessarily hunting mm -hmm. down moose or whatever, the same way that grizzly bears do, but it would find things to eat. I'd be able to buy that. And I think that's, that's mm -hmm. where cryptozoology becomes science, as yeah. opposed to just, like, fantasy, right? Like, there, there's a difference between, like, um... I hate to say it because it's from where I'm near. But like, the chupacabra is this alien that's sucking blood and then morphing into it's a coyote that has mange. Like, we get that, right? Yeah. Um, I think there are certain places in Australia, New Guinea, parts of Africa that could very well house new, significantly large species. Oh, hey, um... That said, I'm not an expert on those, so that's for the people who are experts to discuss, but I do think it is interesting. Well, hey, you have reports of um, the Macaulay and Bembe from the Congo, and you hear people go, oh, it can't possibly be a living sauropod, as some people claim. Right, but for me, it's like, well, how about you just don't brush away the entire possibility? I'm not saying that means it is a living sauropod, because there are alternative possibilities. They might be reporting something that sounds like a living sauropod, but for all you know, it could potentially be the case. It is a mammal that has convergently evolved a sauropod-like build. Right, like either, and, and, and like, so many of those reports too have been translated through multiple languages, it's hard to say for sure. But like, Makola uh, Mkembe, I think is a very interesting concept where the sauropod idea, I think, is very unlikely. Could it be a different species of forest hippo that's hanging around the water? Sure. Could it be a very weird species of giraffe or okapi? Sure. Like, there is some validity to trying to understand those better. Mm. Well, hey. I think just dismissing them out of hand isn't fair to the scientific ideal. Right, because the entire scientific idea is to question. And you build that question based on observations. So, hey, people in whatever area have observed big cats in Australia, Makolo uh, Makembe in the Congo. Great. How do we test this is the next question. Mm. I've, I've already mentioned put up game cams in remote regions of. Uh, Northern Queensland, maybe Papua New Guinea. Um, if, again, you could do the same thing around waterways in the Congo. Mm. There's options here to explore these ideas. And 
maybe you don't find anything, and that's okay. If you don't find Mikolo Mukembe, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find a large sample of what organisms are around in the Congo Basin, which is something that people really haven't done as far as vertebrates, right? Like, you're going to get such a good understanding of these different ecosystems that you can start to piece together what actually is there. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of one thing. The other day, I ended up getting into a debate on Discord about are there big cats in Australia? But I called them Australian big cats because that's what pretty much everyone calls them. Uh, the other term is alien big cats. Alien referring to them being foreign to well, the country. Like alien, yeah, they're foreign. I get that. Yeah, yeah all good. Yeah, so um, uh, someone thought I was talking about them being a new species. So they was basically just sort of strawmanned me and said, oh, it can't be possible. Where's the new species? Show me a new species. And then when someone told them about the livestock killings I told you about, they just went, dingo, didn't elaborate. And then when someone said, yeah, but there's signs saying it's not a dingo, they just went, still dingo. And I'm just sat back thinking, like, uh, how? I mean, what? That's the thing. When you're talking about, I, I think this is a really important thing to understand for sciences, right? Mm -hmm. Whoever you were talking to huh? is, or, or whoever just said dingo, is in one way correct. And let me finish here, right? Because you're asking questions. Whenever you ask a question, you need to be sure to account for the most deliberate answer. And a few answers beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I said the, the steak and venomation thing, right? Like, check the width of bites that say, hey, it's not a dingo. Right, because I was like, okay, well, if it's not a dingo, then it could be a snake bite, and they could be seeing the thing marks as uh, canine marks on a big cat. Right, you need to be as thorough as possible. Well, hey, if um, you're going to try and show that one of these cryptid species exists, uh -huh. you need unequivocal proof. Well, I'm not something that can be explained through other methods or other means. Well, uh, as an example of um, the livestock killings I've talked a lot about so far, um, with those, uh, there was this one series of livestock attacks that ended up happening in the late 70s, early 80s in the quartering area of um, Western Australia, with it being believed to have been a big cat, to the point it actually got nicknamed the quartering cougar. There's an entire book you can actually read on it called Savage Shadow, The Search for the Australian Cougar by uh, David O'Reilly. Uh, Republished in 2011, originally published in 1981. But uh, if I remember correctly, one of the things they had was they had a private vet come in because most of the farmers were very unhappy with um, one of with the uh, veterinarian brought in to, uh, well, brought in by the government to inspect the kills. Because if I remember correctly, it turned out one of his assistants uh, ended up getting... Well, he, there ended up being reports of him allegedly dumping feral pigs in the area to prove his point that feral pigs were behind the killing. So they became very untrustworthy of the government and hired a private vet. And um, one of the things they ended up doing... Well, one of the things the private vet noticed with all the livestock killings they brought of sheep to him was the gap between the teeth of the canine teeth that punctured in to the, um, into the neck of these sheep. The teeth had gaps ranging from as little as three centimeters apart, so a little over an inch, all the way up to ten centimeters, or four inches. So it's one of those things where it's like, are there dingoes big enough to actually do four inches of flesh? Um, <sighs> I mean, it's one of those things where I don't trust either side, if that makes sense. It's like, yeah, yeah sure, the government could definitely be trying to downplay something. Hmm. The medical examiner or whatnot could be trying to upplay something because that clearly got them a more prominent platform, right? Like, I think before 
if something like this happens again and you're aware of it before anyone investigates it, take some samples, throw them off to some lab somewhere, and then find it out. From, from, a, from a genuinely neutral source, right? Like, if you're doing genetics, right? Like, oh, we have this thing that picked up fur that might be from one of these. I'm sorry, cat. You can't bump with the flipping microphone the whole time. I know! You're miserable, but I'm petting you! Sorry, my cat is dramatic AF. Yeah. Meow! Then just lay down here like I asked you to! Look, you can lay down right here. You love me. You love me. Big cat. Did you say big cat? Yeah, we've got bloody big cats, and now we've got the small cat. Oh, yeah, no, she's like five pounds. She is a tiny cat. But, like, she's five pounds of weight and, like, 30 pounds of attitude. Yeah, I know I'm not treating you like you're the most precious princess in the world at this exact moment. He's interviewing a YouTube. He's being interviewed by someone with not even let go. three thousand subs. Let go! Let go! Let go! Cat, what? what? This cat loves me. For, for for the record, this cat loves me. She's very happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, then go down to the ground. Wait. I will love you for like thirty minutes, maybe, when we finish this been two and a half hours already like i'm sure we'll figure it out here in a moment well it's just gonna anyway <laughs> sorry i was discussing uh uh big cats being um they're valid in or, or like some sort of predator is valid in certain regions that are hard to reach um where was i at <laughs> um stuff with the livestock killings and analyzing it Neutral sources. Mm. Right? Like... <sighs> it's one of those things where even in the US, mountain lions have been expanding their range. And people have shown photos of things from, I think, South Carolina, where it's like, that's very clearly a mountain lion. And the US government is just like, nah, they don't live in South Carolina. They're trying to be like, Jedis, like... There are no mountain lions in South Carolina. Yeah, I remember um, watching a documentary like, about they, that. Eastern Cougars. Yeah, and like, yeah, exactly, right? And like, they've moved back through the Appalachians, which is what you should expect. Like, it's a rural, hard to reach area. That's where they're going to move through and they're going to spread out from there. Mm. Um, right? Like, like, the Appalachians are just rugged hills. It, it's, it's the Rocky Mountains eroded. So essentially, you just have, instead of giant mountain peaks, you just have big hills the entire time. Um, mm. As opposed to, like, having a mountain pass you can get through. It's like, nope, everything's eroded through. So, like, all of those mountain passes, nope, there's dirt there now. Um, <laughs> is essentially what happened, uh, geologically. But that means there's pr very well mountain lines there, and none of the eastern states are willing to admit it. Yeah. There's a few that have been flirting with the idea of saying, yeah, there's mountain lions here. Uh, <laughs> but they're in such few numbers as far as we know right now that it's not, again, going back to my wildlife management class, it's not viable for them to say, there's mountain lions here, we can open a hunting season, or we can permit people to shoot them if they're harassing livestock. Mm. Um. It is, it is kind of my understanding. Again, I'm on the opposite side of the U.S., so that is my vague understanding. If I'm unclear, there um, has been actually attempts to, from people to shoot the Black Panthers and um, Pumas roaming Australia. So far, as far as I know, um, none have actually succeeded in actually bringing forth a body. I believe there was an escaped lion that was shot out at Broken Hill in 1985 called the Broken Hill Lioness. But from Emperor it escaped from a safari a few kilometers away. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to get my... Sorry. My, my microphone is moving all over the place. Okay, there you yeah. go. Um, 
No, and like there's even like in the US there's Hearst's Castle, which is H E A R S T, I believe. Um, you know, some rich dip back in the 1930s who went, I'm going to build myself a castle. And I'm also going to stock it with zebras. <laughs> and so, like, there's a pseudo-wild population of zebras in California because of that. Right? Like, it doesn't take a lot for a population to take to, to establish itself, mm. depending on what organism it is. Larger predators are harder. And the thing is, again, like, even with big cats... Lynx, uh, uh, bobcats, like those kinds of things, if they were introduced to Australia without us knowing, they could, within a hundred years, maybe be able to take out a sheep. Right? Like, there's many possible options for why this mythical big cat, mythical, loosely, right? Like, mm-hmm. cryptic. A uh, big cat in Australia may exist. And I'm not sold on any of the ideas until we see something more concrete. Mm. I personally will say I think the most reasonable option could be dingoes or um, large bodied snakes killing whatever it is because they were trampled on or whatever. Um, especially with the evolutionary kind of bent to it of, oh, well, they might be extinct because they haven't been seen in a while. Um, you'd still hypothetically see the bodies of whatever they were hunting. And I know rattlesnakes in the U.S. have been shown to rattle less in the presence of humans. So snakes in Australia could potentially be doing the same thing where they're less likely to strike in the presence of livestock. Whether or not that's the case, like, you know, there's there's tests you can do. There are totally reasonable tests you can do. Um, and again, if I were to pick somewhere for, for some sort of cryptic mammal to be for, Northern Australia, New Guinea, parts of the Congo. Hmm. No questions asked. Uh, and maybe, maybe the Tibetan plateau, because it's just such high elevation, people haven't been able to get up there as regularly. Um, but th- those are my main, my main three: parts of the Congo, New Guinea, Northern Australia. Uh, if you ever get interested in reading through the big cats at some point, I came across a couple. Uh... Well, I came across this study from 2015, <coughs> and then there was also this one from 1976, although I've yet to read it, but it was revised in 2004. So if you're I mean, ever interested... Knowing... Read. Once I know what my plan is for grad school, I will be much more able to interact with the, the the other pieces of media you gave me, the bunyips and Bigfoots and the big cat, Australian big cats. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of being able to sit down and read them, right? And, like, if I end up going to grad school somewhere and it's like, well, I'm going to be on a plane for two and a half hours going to whatever museum to look at whatever. Yeah, sure. I can, I can download one of those as a book and just flip through it on my Kindle. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I remember oh. reading. Well, I remember with the interview I did with Red Raptor Wrights. Uh, I remember with uh, a couple times when I talked about books, he said uh, he's just too busy to read through books and stuff, right? Because if I remember, he said, um, besides doing a uh, YouTube, he's also got a job teaching history in school. So uh, that's his main thing. So uh, no, I'm like, I am trying to go to grad school, right? Plus. Huh? The YouTube stuff. So, like, my ability to read things has been limited. Um, honestly, I've audiobooks. My God, audiobooks are so good. <laughs> Should see if you can get an audiobook version of some of the ones I've sent you. 
Oh, no, no, no. If they are, if they are available as audiobooks, 100% I'm getting them. Sadly, um, or no, like, the, don't the, think some of the best books I've listened to have been mostly David Hohen's books. Yeah. Which I listened to two or three of his over the course of the year. And then I listened to um, Michael Benton's Extinctions book. I read his When Life Nearly Died about the Permian Triassic, but I think his Extinctions book is really well done. Mm. And then I listened to a handful of other books that were like more political, like the Jakarta Method and stuff, which, if you're interested in politics at all, Jakarta Method, great book. Um, outside of that, I, I, th- th- that's mostly what I listen to. Uh, mainly just, uh, I prefer to sit down and read through the books rather than listen. Uh, it's, just, it's just time. Yeah. Like, I 100% <laughs> appreciate that. Jakarta Method is still the best book I read all year. You should see the massive collection of books I've mounted so far. I'm getting everything from all sorts of authors. I have a couple books from David Hone, Darren Nash, Michael Benton, Robert Backer, all sorts of people. <laughs> so, um, I guess with the questions okay, stuff... Now, we'll... now jump to the rest of the video. <laughs> now jump to the rest of the questions, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to... um. I guess do that as a part two. No, no, no. Just get it started. Okay, okay. Do it now. I like, I got time. I just wanted to know. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we had an opening and an ending recorded. And as much as a cluster F as that was, I think there's great content there that will sell. If that makes sense. This, is, <laughs> this has definitely been a podcast. <laughs> All right, so one of the podcasts of all time. I haven't really thought of like any specific questions to ask you, so it's just okay, the general. Give me stuff. my general ones then. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're good. Uh, what got you interested in dinosaurs, or I guess um just paleontology in general? Okay, so this goes way back. I'm 30 now. Mm-hmm. Do you know what movie released 30 years ago? Oh no, I cannot definitely think of it. Jurassic Park, and according to my mother, I was born in October. I mean, not according to my mother, I was born in October, I just was. But apparently, when they went to watch Jurassic Park in the theaters, I kicked a lot during the Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, breakout scene, and it's been... Holy shit, cat. Sorry, my cat just launched herself into my lap. Um... Regardless, uh, me kicking during, regardless, me kicking during Jurassic Park is seemingly just what started me on dinosaurs, because I never really stopped. Uh, when I was like four, my sister, who's five years older than I was, went, Zeke's going to be a paleontologist, he's going to study dinosaurs. But unfortunately for me, I went, no, chemistry has real jobs. And then I dropped out of college because I didn't care about chemistry. Um, Anyway, a few years pass. I'm working at a gas station. Um, Specifically, it's like the the kind of gas station that's attached to a grocery store. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with those, those those exist in the U.S. Um. Which meant I had Wi-Fi, and the managers never checked on us. So I just watched every single lecture that had ever been done at the Royal Tyrell Museum of Paleontology. And I went, damn. After watching all these, I need more answers. (laughs) And then I started my... I, I started back up into school after that. Because I was genuinely passionate about paleontology. Right, like it was just this like reminder, like when it, when when I was first, even before high school, paleontology felt so distant from me. Right, like there's no one doing paleontology near me that I knew. It was really hard to try and get involved. But being able to ask those questions based on those talks at Royal Tyrell really helped me to understand this this is what i wanted to do 
And if they'd had those opportunities earlier with paleontology, um, I probably would have just jumped into paleontology earlier. But that's what it was. I went to Glendale Community College, which has a great geology program. If you're looking for a community college, sorry, my cat's being a dipshit. Um, rewind. Uh, and so I went to Glendale Community College in central Arizona, which great geology program. Nobody there, though, is... I bumped my microphone. I think you did. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I was... I'm not Italian, but I use my hands to accentuate things. <laughs> um, anyway, so jumping back to... And so then I went to uh, Glendale Community College, where I was fortunate that they had a great geology program. I love every geologist there. They've been wonderful. Everyone I took a class with. But unfortunately, none of them are paleontologists. So also, me asking paleo questions, they're like, Oh. Um, fortunately, the Northern Arizona University had a paleo specific geology emphasis. So it's a degree in geology with an emphasis in paleontology, which I took. Unfortunately, my advisor also kind of screwed me there. So I ended up graduating a year late. But that also meant I could get a degree in biology as well. So, I mean, like, there's two kinds of paleontologists. There's biologists who know a whole lot of geology, and there's geologists who know a whole lot of biology. And I just kind of slid right there in the middle. Um, so I think, I think to your question, I've already, I, to your question, I've always been interested in paleontology. I've not necessarily had the opportunities to explore it the way I've wanted. But I think my passion for it will let me get to where I am, where I'm applying for grad schools for paleontology. I have good leads on grad schools. And when I went to the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting this past October, I was able to hold serious conversations with people simply because of my passion for this field. And I think if you have a passion for this field, you can make it. It is hard. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. You just heard me talk to you all about going to multiple different schools in order to be able to make it. Mm. But if it is what you are passionate about, it is rewarding, and it feels good to be able to do it. Mm. I th I, I, and I think that's where I really want to emphasize. It feels good to be able to do it. Because if, if you're someone who's passionate in paleontology, you have questions and you want them answered. And asking those questions, even without being able to answer those questions yourself, if you can ask those questions to paleontologists, people who are at universities, at museums, and they cannot answer it for you, that means you are doing the right things. You're asking the right questions. You're asking something that could be answered, but that the other people who are experts in their field don't know. And that means you can be a paleontologist. Interesting. So, uh, next question is, uh, what got you interested in YouTube? So, for YouTube specifically, for me, it was the monthly reviews, right? Like, I started those in 2017? <laughs> Question mark? Uh, don't ask me, because it's going to make me feel old. But, um... <sighs> You know, I'm looking that so up now. When anyone... did you start? <laughs> yeah, if, feel free to tab it in afterwards. Don't tell me. Um. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is, was it right? 2017. Oldest video on your channel is told 2017 paleontology in brief review. 
from awesome. six years ago. When was it uploaded? It, it would have been uploaded in January 2018. It says January 9th, 2018. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, like, if you take me back to those <laughs> first absolutely horrid videos, you need to buy me something that I can drink to forget it. Um, <laughs> regardless. It looks weird seeing um, a younger raptor chatter for some reason. I, regardless, at that time, it was a period where paleo YouTube was kind of in flux, if that makes sense, right? Like, SciShow <laughs> started doing less paleo episodes. Trey the Explainer started uploading less and started uploading more martyr, modern uh, archaeological kind of stuff, right? Which, like, totally valid i think that's also very interesting if if dead things weren't in rocks i'd be a historian more like trey right um but there's dead things in rocks <laughs> and i'm like there's not anyone doing kind of like reviews of what's actually happening in paleontology and huge hugest Biggest shout out I can ever give to the plus one uh, monthly reviews that I don't even remember what her name was. Um, but they plus one had a here are our paleo papers and they would just list paleo papers for the month. Huh. And eventually I had to give up because it's a lot of effort. And we tried contacting them and figuring out how they did this and all this kind of stuff. And it was still very hard. Um, but honestly, PLOS One and their paleo reviews carried us for the first two years of our channel. Because I would not have been able to find the rest of the papers that I do for our monthly reviews otherwise. Um, mm. But I think, again... Back to your question, what got me interested in um, YouTube is just there wasn't anyone just giving general explanations about most of the paleo that went on, right? Like, I view paleontology as a subject which is not complicated except for the jargon. If I say a fossil is Cleans Bachian, you have no idea what I mean. Because that's a specific stage of whatever thing it's from. That's just an example. Like, I use, I don't, I, I honestly don't know what it's from. Um, if it's a Mastrictian, I can say, hey, it's latest Cretaceous. Say mm -hmm. Albion, hey, it's kind of mid, mid Cretaceous. But like, 99% of the average per. <laughs> But, like, 99% of the average people don't even know what the Albion is. Mm. I can say Middle Cretaceous. And I think that's one of those big things that really pushed me towards it, is where it's like, I can explain slightly complex parts of paleontology and research with paleontology without needing to emphasize certain parts of it. Without needing to, excuse me, um, confuse it with jargon. Huh. Yeah, I find that a bit annoying. With um, well, I remember being set back thinking that I want to get into um reading through scientific papers rather than just random junk I find on the internet. Right, like random websites who might just basically copy paste a Wikipedia article and then just compact it down a little. Um, but yeah, then I remember just like searching up, I don't know, a Tyrannosaurus, and then I'm just sat back looking like, oh my god. And then I read through some of these, and I'm just sat back looking like, what the hell is Arctometatarsalian condition? So that's one of those things. Well, I think that's one. Of, I think that's one of the best examples of jargon right like arctometatarsalian if you're familiar with the jargon you know what that means if you're not it sounds like absolute gibberish but very simply outside of that jargon 
It just means it's a special condition where like the middle foot bone gets pushed up between the other two outer foot bones. So like if you think of your like generic theropod foot, it has three big toes. It just means the the, the kind of hand bone, foot bone relative, um, gets pinched up between the two outer bones. And that helps really stabilize the foot. It means it can run long distances, and that's wonderful. But if you say to anyone on the street, hey, do you know what the Arctometatarsalian condition is? People are going to look at you like you're flipping insane. Right? So, like, you, you, you picked one of my favorite examples for this, where it's like, Arctometatars... <laughs> It has an arctometatarsal. What does that mean if you don't know what it actually means? Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's like some dictionary you can get where it's just the random jargon paleontologists use. I believe one of the uh, books I have, 1997's Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs, published by Academic Press, edited by Philip Curry and Kevin Padian. I think they have a massive glossary in there of... um all the different typical scientific terms you'll see used. It's something like 600 different definitions, I think, in there. So it's probably best I read through that in order to help better understand most of it. And, I mean, that's one of those things, too, right? Like, with paleontology, people mention... I've talked to multiple potential advisors who are like, if you go to grad school with me, I'm going to make you cut open dead human bodies. <laughs> because... Being able to do gross anatomy and teach gross anatomy is a very important skill as far as jobs are concerned, right? You can be an anatomist and a paleontologist, but you're more likely to get a job as an anatomist than you are to get a job as a paleontologist. I've had multiple people go, no, you should be able to, if you're able to take gross human anatomy, and do human dissections, that's good. And like, so people are built for that, and that's fine. I think there should also be more funding for paleo, regardless of being able to do human dissections. So like, if I ever become president, run for those fields, because I'm not going to make you cut up with people to get a job. <laughs> but that's just where we're at in the U.S., it reminds me of one thing I came across from, I think it was on Twitter, by uh, Darren Nash, where someone asked him about um, getting degrees and stuff, and would he recommend it, getting degrees in paleontology, and I think his response was something like, a, a, you can get them, but it's not really necessary uh, to be into paleontology and do paleontology as a career, <coughs> but it does help with like better job opportunities. However, I remember him also saying, if I remember correctly, that he's been unable, been unable to get a job in paleontology himself, a proper job. Uh, so he's just self-employed. I mean, hang on. Yeah. I'm sorry, I am... Just trying to find something. Yeah, if I can find it. And I, uh, I'm not able to right off the top of my head. But there was something discussing just general geology. And like geologists specifically as under and as an undergrad degree mm -hmm. are very very sought after. I can talk like a real person sought after, which means essentially geologists should be being hired. And that includes paleontologists, but since it doesn't make money right away, essentially a lot of schools are cutting geology degrees, despite the fact that geology is one of the most sought after degrees. And especially when you look at like, do you know how carbon capture technology works? No. Okay. So carbon capture technology is essentially, what if we built a giant mine into the deep earth? Okay. 
Mm-hmm. When you took a bunch of CO2 and just pumped it down there and got rid of a bunch of the CO2 in our atmosphere and just left underground for the next 50, 60 million years. Like, that's an easy amount of time that we don't need to worry about it, right? Um, that's essentially where it's one of those things where it's like geologists are in high demand. But nobody is training geologists. Like NAU, Northern Arizona University, cut a lot of their um, geologists, their geology program, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Reminds me of one thing I remember, I remember searching Go. around on um, like uh, for getting degrees in paleontology in Australia. And if I remember correctly, there's only one university in Australia. Uh, that actually gives a degree in paleontology. I believe it's I mean, a, I and that's, Flinders that's, University. No, and that's totally fair. Like, mm-hmm. one of the professors I had when I was at a local community college, which means tier college, associate's degree, etc. Um, she graduated in the 90s, I think. But anyway, she mentioned, like, she was super into paleontology, but the fact was micropaleontology was where all the money was. Because you look for things like um, conodont teeth, those kind of things to figure out where oil was. <laughs> and, like, that's one of those things that I think is very important, right? Like, if any other paleontologist who I know is passionate about paleontology, decides that they want to make money before doing research. Yeah, that's totally fair, right? Like, if you're making money for an oil company in order to provide for a family because you can't find a job anywhere else, I can't judge them for that. I think that's one of the really important things with paleontology specifically as we're going forward is like knowing that oil companies are going to ask you to drill for oil for for more oil. (laughs) Knowing that oil companies are going to ask you to drill for more oil. Um and like that's just the reality of it. Hmm. You can laugh at me, that's fine. <laughs> well, any, uh, well, next question is, any particular projects you'd like to make for YouTube? Mm-hmm. <laughs> for YouTube specifically, A. Spinosaurus? <laughs> Spinosaurus is a cryptid. Spinosaurus doesn't exist. And if it does, you can show me the flippin' holotype. Oh wait, you can't, because it was blown the hell up. Spinosaurus is fake, and it isn't real. Now, when I put up my video for this, which I guess now I need to ask you when you're putting this up, because I need to be prepared for it. Um, I have most of the script written for this, but Spinosaurus isn't real. Spinosaurus is a nomen dubium. Everything from Morocco should be called Sigomasosaurus until people go back to Egypt in the Bahariya Basin and find new Spinosaurus material. That is that is my hottest take, and I will fight people on it. Uh, it reminds me of when I was um right because I remember. Oh my god, I, I will fight you all so hard on this. Sorry, I just want to emphasize one more time. With YouTube <laughs> and making Wars the... does not exist. With one of the, uh, vid- Right, well, the main video that got my channel to take off was I did a video on Tyrannosaurus Rex, of course, and that blew up and it's, I think, sitting at close to 9,000 views. Then I did one on Acrocanthosaurus, I think that's closing in on 6,000. I did one on Saurophaganax, that's at nearly 3,500. Alright, so just going up and up and up. Uh, 
it's sort of leveled out now. Most of my videos fall somewhere between 50 and 1,000 views now. But um, I remember I'm being. I'm just gonna say. I was about. Well, one of the things I, I was thinking of doing, I was thinking at one point of maybe should I do a video on Spinosaurus, but I'm just sat back thinking, considering how 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 confusing Spinosaurus is at the moment, I'm just gonna stay the hell away from it. <laughs> That's me, just me. I I I will let you chime in with a. If if you if I am able to record this video of Spinosaurus doesn't exist, I will absolutely let you just record a single uh, guest line of Spinosaurus is bullshit <laughs> or something <laughs> equivalent. Imagine like that. honestly, just me presenting my ideas. You going if Spinosaurus is real, give me the holotype. I could imagine real Australian accent. I could imagine that already, right? You see something. Spinosaurus isn't real from Raptor Chatter, FT, Calvin the Carnotaurus, and the sole voice line I have is Spinosaurus doesn't exist. Or like Spinosaurus Bitch. is bullshit and it just cuts. <laughs> That's it. God, Spinosaurus is such a fucking horse shite. <laughs> like, here's the thing. I could vent about Spinosaurus for two and a half years. I'm going to stop here because I will keep it bitching about it. Um, this is going to be more than anything inspiration to finish that script, though, and actually record it. <laughs> so, yeah, Spin Title. Buddy. The title of the video, Spinosaurus is bullshit, and you all know it. <laughs> Fucker. <laughs> oh, oh, you think Spinosaurus is real? Show me the holotype. I love how your mic is sounding a little bit lower in quality than previous parts of this podcast. So it somehow I mean, makes it even funnier, because it sounds like some 12-year-old... Just rambling. <laughs> to be fair, I'm literally sitting with the most shanky ass microphone plus a, a spit barrier for it. So, like, <laughs> the fact that I've been yelling into this for the last, it's 10 o'clock, three hours, <laughs> I think fits perfectly. <laughs> so, right. regardless. Spinosaurus okay. doesn't exist. No, 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 no. We're jumping back to your main questions. I'll right. chat with you about Spinosaurus when it comes up. Right. Thoughts on modern paleo media. So, like, films, shows, stuff like that. Documentaries. It depends on what paleo media you're talking about. Because, on one hand, I'm going to jump back a few years for what it's worth. Um, mm -hmm. Jurassic World, the Fallen Kingdom, where they kind of like split it between the island and the uh, manor, fucking slaps. But also, they should have just done one. <laughs> they should have just done one movie on the island and another movie on the manor, because like. The uh, Indominus Raptor? Indoraptor? Yeah. Indoraptor. Great as a comparison to, like, the, um... Uh, uh... The Xenomorph and the Aliens, right? Like, mm -hmm. I would have just 100% been like, Listen, Colin Trevorrow, you're directing everything that happens on the island as a full movie. And then I'd have been like... All right, Ripley Scott. Maybe this dinosaur creepy as fuck. <laughs> and like in the manner that would have worked, right? Like if you had Ripley Scott from the Alien franchise doing uh, the Indoraptor as a you know very 
alien, like, horror monster. It would have been so good. As opposed to the kind of comedy they ended up as, right? Like, I remember when uh, Blue pushed it onto the, the, the uh, Triceratops at the end of the movie. I literally just laughed out loud. Because I'm a terrible human being. Uh. Um, like, in the theater. Like, I was just 100% like, I am laughing at this. Because <laughs> it's so dumb. Um... And, like, the thing is, I love B-movies, right? And, like, if they're going to accept B-movies, they need to accept it. If they had accepted it from the beginning, God, I'd have killed for that. Um, coming into uh, Dominion, because those are the main media markets, <laughs> uh, Dominion could have easily been three, three movies, right? Like, you split up uh, Fallen Kingdom into On the Island in the manor, and then you split up Dominion <laughs> into three movies, but they push it into one because they're idiots. Um, like, Dominion very easily could have been, hey, dinosaurs living among people. Hey, some things are going bad, and we need to try and fix those. Hey, the rest of the locust arc, all that kind of BS, right? Like, easy. So easy. You could have released this in 2028. Would have been great. You guys have made a ton of money instead of just out a shite movie. <laughs> um, and that's just for major media productions. Now, outside of that, um, which I'm sure you're slightly frustrated about me, just chatting shite about Jurassic World. Um, <clears throat> Prehistoric Planet is great, right? Like, yeah. every presentation they had of the organisms felt organic. My main issues are me being a massive dork, right? Going like, oh, um, I'm sorry, you're saying that these uh, Imperators were chasing this random ornithischian across the ice instead of just putting this in the Ice Worlds episode. Like, mm. I think I think my video on Prehistoric Planet genuinely discusses my issues with it because I think there were the second season of Prehistoric Planet. There were multiple sections which could easily fit in two sections of the first. Yeah, I agree. It, and it wasn't made as an individual product. I have not finished the Netflix series. What is it? Prehistoric, not Prehistoric Planet. Life on our planet. Life um, on our planet. I haven't finished that. You're not going to comment on that right now because this is me commenting on it. It seemed okay, but I don't think it captured... <sighs> what, what's the first one? Um, Prehistoric Planet? Yeah, then you had Life on a Planet. Okay, so yeah. Um, so, like, looking back, like, Prehistoric Planet did a good job of represent, representing the organisms as individuals. They're trying to do their thing. Mm -hmm. From the little bit I've seen of life on our planet, it tries to call it back to our current planet too much without doing enough to show how the organisms that lived before us were different. For me, I've just found I'm sorry, it I'm sure you're you're sitting here going, he's just ranted for thirty minutes. <laughs> for me I with life on our planet, I found it sort of annoying of how it cut between um the prehistoric stuff and then the new stuff. Like it didn't really right? give you like no no it, no. It didn't for no, me, I at think least, that's good. For me, at least, it didn't really give enough time because 
well, you sort of end up getting, um, you get fixed into, well, you, by the time uh, some of the scenes end, right, you're sort of in tune with that, and then it sort of gets thrown off when they move on to the next one. Like, you go from Allosaurus hunting sauropods, juvenile sauropods, right, and you said they're like, oh, this is so interesting, and then you sort of get thrown off when they move on to bugs mating. No, and, like, I think that's part of it, right? Like, yeah. even just jumping back to not walking with dinosaurs, walking with beasts, walking with monsters, I think it is, the, the Paleozoic version of walking with, right? Yeah. Like, those organisms all seem <sighs> integrated into their environment, right? If you went, hey, this is our su- our not super scorpion, our sea scorpion, and it's gonna push up onto land a little bit to try and eat the the vertebrates that are there. Cool, easy, done. Like, that's it. And for the secret, biology and paleontology are complicated. The trends which we see are less complicated. And as long as paleontologists can understand those trends well enough, then we can explain those to other people, right? Like, Permian Trassic extinction, 95% of life dies off. If I say that, and I go, well, it's because of ocean acidification and warming, and I go, this is the same thing that's happening in our oceans, people can panic about it, because I can say 95% of life in the ocean died off. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of trying to connect the fossil record to the modern record. Hmm. Right, so, uh, similar question, but not really about the films, documentaries, shows, uh, more so about the internet. Thoughts on the paleontology side of YouTube? Mm. <sighs> there are a ton of wonderful people on paleo YouTube. Yeah, I agree with that. Many of them are very kind and polite, and I would love to work with them. Mm. At the same time, I think with my specific monthly reviews, I've mentioned two potential advisors. I'm the only person on paleontology YouTube who will mention something like brachiopods. Hmm. Which is more of a personal thing than anything else, right? Like, I'm going to mention brachiopods. If you don't, that's a you thing. But I think if we don't understand the entire uh, breadth of what's being published about different organisms, be them brachiopods, be them bryozoans, be them crinoids, be them Tyrannosaurus rex or other Tyrannosaurus species, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think if we don't talk about all those, we're not giving a genuine impression of paleontology. Mm. I think a lot of those invertebrate studies are very important because they essentially lay the base work for the methods to be done in vertebrate paleontology. Um, I don't know. Like I said, YouTube paleo people are wonderful. Yeah, that's... I love the chats I've had with them. I think mm. most of them and myself are just approaching this from different ideas. Or, or not different ideas, but from different frameworks, different lenses. 
that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, every each well, one has, well. has their that. own sort of niche. All right, like um, or you have YouTube channels like uh, Extinct Zoo, where he just does these more so more so like what I've been doing of general information type videos. I like to call them, where it's not like very specific, like did T Rex have bad eyesight. But it also just gives you a broad understanding of the animal. Like, here's when we first discovered it, here's when it was named, here's stuff about its bite force, here's stuff about uh, where it lived and all that. Then you have other channels like Red Raptor Rights, where he does his documentary reviews. I mean, yeah, sure, there's been other YouTubers who've done that, such as, example, the channel Paleo Nerd, who did an entire series uh, <coughs> reviewing Jurassic Fight Club. <laughs> but Red Raptor Rights has been the only channel really out there who's actually put out a consistent amount of reviews, and not just that, but even ranks them in terms of accuracy, so you can sort of get an idea of which ones are probably better to look at and watch than others. Then you have people like you with your monthly reviews, where you go over all the most recent stuff in paleontology, uh, for that period of the year, and then, well, just on and on it goes, you have more and more people who might make specific content on whatever. I mean, I came across <laughs> this YouTube channel called Chimera Suchus, and if I'm correctly, he does videos more so about um, Triassic crocodilians and uh, just prehistoric crocs in general, uh, alongside the odd video on some other things here and there, such as, uh, uh, I think he did a video on why Tyrannosaurus got so big, and a uh, Barosaurus and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, everyone carves out their own little niche on there. It, it sort of reminds me of one thing I was thinking of doing, more so like with uh, with how you have your channel, uh, with the monthly reviews. I was thinking of doing a video of like a... or maybe doing a video series where it's of like a, all the different books on paleontology that come out each uh, month or each year. Because you do get some fantastic <clears throat> books out there that I do think should at least be it, brought up. Because, yeah, sure, a five-minute YouTube video Talking might be about good. books can be hard. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but for me it's like, well, yeah, sure, a five-minute YouTube video might be good, but sometimes it's actually better to pick up a book to read on some of these animals. Like, I see some of the stuff on the internet, I'm just sat there like, pick up a book, mate. So it would be good no, to... No, like, uh, I know where you're going from. Yeah. Like, do some sort of thing, like, hey, Peeing here's a book... Peeing it up is hard. Like, uh, no, here's a book coming out in November this year on Mosasaurs. So if you're interested in Mosasaurs, you can go get that. I mean... Yeah. Just as an example, right? <clears throat> I'm really into books. I like getting all the reference works. I really love using reference works for videos more than uh, online sources. And, um... If, if you look in the last, I'd say, seven or so years, eight years or so, there's been a fantastic amount of stuff on marine reptiles of ancient times to come out. Right, just to give you a quick timeline of what I mean, you had, in 2017, you had the second edition of Michael Everhart's uh, critically acclaimed book, Oceans of Kansas, uh, A Natural History of the Western Interior Seaway. Absolutely amazing book. Only real problem is it's only narrowed down to the Western Interior Seaway, so don't expect to learn about European uh, fauna on this sort of subject. Um, then in, I think it was 2019, you had the republication of 1967's, um, I think it was told something like Systematics and Morphology of American Mosasaurs by the now-deceased Dale Russell, uh, which I believe Michael Everhart said in Oceans of Kansas is the best reference work out there on Mosasaur morphology. Right, so it's good to see that back in print after over 50 years. <coughs> then, yeah. then, I think in 2021, you had the publication of Ocean Life in the Time of Dinosaurs in its French version, all for it to be finally um, published in English last year. In 2022, you had uh, the priest, the priest, the Princeton Field Guide to Mesozoic Sea Reptiles by Gregory Paul, and then just a few months after, in 2023, uh, you had Darren Nature's Ancient Sea Reptiles. So it seems like 
the last several years has been a great time for books on prehistoric uh, marine reptiles. Well, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, I think with where our discussion ended, I think we're good. Um, again, just remember to tag in that if you want to follow me kind of thing. Um, <laughs> There's a lot going on mm. with paleo slash crypto zoology. Yeah. And I am here to answer the questions I can. Indeed. All right. So, uh, okay. We got with three- that in mind. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to say with that in mind, mm-hmm. have a good one. I think the resources you gave me are really good. Indeed. Um, I'll try and dip into them if I have time. A lot of that depends on grad school applications, etc. Well, if you have if you have more important things in life, then don't worry. No, like it's for me, it's ten thirty at night right now. (laughs) Which we started at seven o'clock my time. We've had good fun, but also. I need to go use the restroom and also just turn off the chat and fall asleep. Yeah. So, well, was, y'all good. Yeah, I was going to say there's three um, questions left, but. Chat um, in the future. I was going to say if there's. Chat in the future. Yeah. Message me on Discord. You got me on Discord. <laughs> you shoot those to me. Do that too or something. There's worse things that could happen. But yeah, y'all uh, good. I think that's good for now. Okay. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen. I, okay. <laughs> Y'all good. Bye. Bye. See you later. So, wrap the chatter. If people want to follow you on social media, where should they go? If you want to follow me on social media, I have to recommend my YouTube because that's where I do most of my social media. However, I also have uh, social media on Twitter under raptor underscore chatter we're talking about not necessarily just my research that's happening but other research that's happening and different videos i post on youtube as well as also be able to just generally engage with the general audience i have i also have a discord which you can find linked in my youtube videos again if you just search raptor chatter on youtube you should be able to find me With all that said, this has been wonderful. Thank you.